Good morning, Ooh. everybody. Oh, where's my coffee? Where's my coffee? I have a fresh coffee. It's been a little while since I've done one of these. A few weeks at least. I've got to re-familiarize myself. But there was somebody uh, creeping around my door before and ding dong, who is it? It is none other than Mr. Rob Garland. Hey, Rob. Hey. hey. Don't mind me as I sip my coffee. How are you doing, mate? I'm doing all right. Thank you. That's nice good. to be here. Thanks for having me on the show. No problem, mate. I see you've got your black T-shirt, which is customary for us musos. I thought that was the uniform we needed. So, yeah, yeah. I got my, I got my coffee, so we're good. Oh, yeah. we're set. It does make life easy um, being a part of the, the black T-shirt brigade. I, it's yep. like, hmm, which black T-shirt and camo pants will I wear today? <laughs> Decision-making. You're speaking away. my language, my friend. You're speaking my language. Although I've got to say, and we were talking earlier, and um, I'm on the Gold Coast in Australia where it's quite – hot in summer and i've gotten sick of the black t-shirts so it's either black singlets or i went out and bought some white t-shirts and my friends see me and they're like dude what what's up what what's with the what's with the white shirt <laughs> so um <clears throat> it's good to bust this one out for a moment they might be thinking you're in a parallel universe with that well you know like it's you but not you with the white shirt bizarro rick was that yeah. was that a thing? Bizarro world on Su on Superman, right? Remember that where they yeah. had a yeah a, an offshoot world that was all a bit backwards, and there was like was a, that, was on, I remember one on Seinfeld. They did one on Seinfeld. Oh, did they like really? That. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Rob, you live in LA, which is very convenient because you teach at the Musicians Institute, which, as we were saying before, um, thanks, Bernie. I, I, I saw that before. My, my volume was a bit low, so my friend just told me to turn it up. Um, which is very convenient, man. When I was growing up, going to the Guitar Institute of Technology was the dream, <laughs> uh, but not really attainable for somebody in, in my position at the time. But I'd, I'd watch and learn others that have gone there, and which makes me think like to to be a teacher there, you'd really have to know your stuff, and you'd be hit with a lot of questions from very dedicated students. So uh, I do want to touch on your teaching. Um, but firstly, I just want to ask the question, what started the love affair with the electric guitar for Rob Garland? Well, um, let me see. So there was a lot of music around the house when I was, when I was a kid, my, my mum and dad had tons of those, um, 45s, you know, the, the singles and, and it was a lot of like sixties music, Buddy Holly and Richie Valens and all that. And there were certain things that I kind of really got into bizarrely. There was an album by, um, what was his name? Uh, the, uh, and Eno Morricone, the 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 Western uh, theme album, which I just loved, and she's just play over and over again. But but nothing, you know, the pop music of the day and stuff. And I loved Elton John and Billy Joel and all that, and Queen and all that. But but what really did it for the guitar for me was, even though the radio in England was playing pop music, um, there was on on the BBC there was a radio show that was on Friday nights from ten till midnight. And my friends and I used to, and I was, I was about sort of uh, 13, something like that, 13, 14. And my friends and I used to record it on cassette because <laughs> I'm old. And then the next day we would listen back to this two hour radio show. And, th and you'll think this is funny, but this is the only place we would hear Ozzy, Van Halen, uh, Judas Priest, Def Leppard, White Snake, all of the American, I mean, I know some of that's British, but I mean, in terms of like what you think of as kind of like American rock, you know, and, and British, but, but the sort of hard rock, I guess you would say, we used to hear that on that radio show. And the thing about that music was, unlike a lot of the other music that I was hearing on the radio, it was all guitar based, you know, it's like, you can't listen to Van Halen and not appreciate the guitar, right? Absolutely. So, and, and so, you know, um, Iron Maiden was another one, you know, and so um, hearing that music made it all about the guitar. And originally, when I was about 13, I thought, oh, I'd really like to play the drums, you know, and, and we used to get together friends and, and, you know, bang on things and try and make a drum kit out of my mum's saucepans, you know, which I'm sure went over really well. But, uh, <laughs> but eventually, um, my best friend and I decided that we would have a go at the guitar. And uh, I was I was 14 going on 15 and we both got guitars at the same time. And that and the direct influence there was that radio show and all the music we discovered through that. And as well as the well-known 
ones, you know, the Van Halen's and all that. There were all these offshoots. There was, you know, there was there was um, let's think there was bands like well, Extreme, for example, wasn't on the radio until More Than Words, but this radio show would play their first album. Oh, cool! You know, would make tracks in their first album. Yeah, and there were all these like German metal bands like Bonfire, and of course there was Kingdom Come, which you know, and at which. But but what happened was with all these bands, like when I heard Kingdom Come. And I read in a magazine how they blatantly ripped off Led Zeppelin. Then I went to the record shop and I bought Led Zeppelin two and three. And it's like, oh, I get it. You know, yeah. so yeah. it was, I always, I always came at all this music backwards in a way. I always started like the Van Halen I was hearing was 5150. Yeah. Right. Like I came into it right in, what was that, 86? Came into it about there. And so then it was like, wait, I need to go find out what, you know, what the real Van Halen or whatever you, you know. Yes. Uh, yeah whatever you call it but the rock years you know so so i did everything sort of backwards like that and same thing with all these rock bands like white snake that were essentially a blues based band especially their early stuff then i would go back and listen to actual blues you know so each yeah. one of these things would take me on this long path back but i guess the short answer is hearing hard rock on the radio and it was tucked away at that 10 o'clock to midnight spot you know it's like it wasn't going to mess with the duran durans and the tears for fears it was yeah. going to be you know like tucked away at night so that was what did it you know awesome awesome sounds like we must be of, of similar age because um just a lot yeah. of the the music that you're saying there and i totally oh, relate man like for the longest time um if I was playing in the style of Mike McCready from Pearl Jam, people would go, oh, you're yeah. into Hendrix. And I'd say, yeah. no, I'm trying to play like the guy from Pearl Jam. Oh, right. um, or, yeah, I'd play you know, some Nuno and p people would say, oh, old Van Halen. I'm like, oh, I don't really know that much old Van Halen. But So it is funny how that leads yeah. to uh, discovering older stuff. It does, and you know, there's that Pearl Jam song "Yellow Lead Better." Yeah, I had a, lot, I have, I've had so many students over the years think that that was a guitar style that Mike McCready invented, you know. And it's like, actually, if let's go look at Stevie Ray, and then let's go back and look at Hendrix, and of course, once you get to Hendrix, then you go, let's go back and look at Curtis Mayfield, and exactly. like, there's a, you know, let's go to Motown, and there's there's always this line running through all this stuff, which I think is fascinating, you know, yeah, really exciting. But it is funny. There's there's a lot of a, a lot of um, like kids that come out thinking, you know, John Frusciante or the Pearl Jam guys invented that kind of chordal style, you know, which I mean, they certainly did cool things with it, but it was already around, you know. Yeah. I, yeah. I do remember two very specific examples as well. Like right around the time when I got my first guitar, there were two things that I had a, a like a physical reaction to. And the first one was um, Voodoo Child on the intro when Hendrix. Hendrix bends the G string and with the distortion and he grabs his pickup select. I don't know if you remember, and he and he just starts hitting it like that. And it starts to go to feedback as it. I mean, even now I can sort of feel what I felt when I was 14. And I was like, there, that is that's gotta be the coolest thing in the entire world, you know. And then the other one were, were the, the arpeggios in Sultans of Swing. Yes. By, by because that was on the radio. And I remember yeah. hearing that at that time as well, and just going, Oh, I love that. I don't know what it is, but I love it. You know, and those two. Those two things, it, it, it's interesting because they even now, so many years later, that emotional, physical response to those things is still there, you know. And it's so that's definitely a big part of, of you know. I wanted to, I wanted to do things on the guitar that made me that excited as when I heard those kind of things. Yeah, know? yeah, you know the the whole Mark Knopfler thing that was a, yeah. a big big thing for me in the early days, yeah. um, and just with his style of holding his hand anchoring it and doing it like this yeah. Yeah. i couldn't get my hand in that position and i used to tape up my fingers to try and emulate the way that mark does that um now rather than using those two fingers yeah. uh and like this i hold a pick and i use the next two and i get right. that kind of sound but i don't like telling people that mark was a huge influence um because as soon as i do as soon as i start playing people just look at me going yeah, you're just trying to play like Mark Offler now, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, another thing about his playing, though, that was, you know, was quite tricky was how it was really rhythmically interesting too, wasn't it? You know, it wasn't mm. just plucking those chords like on the beat and everything. There were all sorts of little syncopated parts and little, you know, almost almost like he was 
creating that whole pocket with that with that style as well and also the tone as well you could he could hear that tone was rolled off and it was so powerful you know? yeah absolutely great, great yeah. now you're saying about earlier about the the radio and hearing yeah. all that all that music all the, the hard rock and metal and stuff you know there's a station I've only just found here on the Gold Coast, uh, Rebel FM, and they play a lot of the stuff that I'd only ever read about in magazines, uh, mostly American bands. And I'm forever driving up my phone, charging here, and um, I'll have Shazam there, and something will come on, and I'll be like, "Hey Siri, what, what, what's this music?" And oh, <laughs> Siri just came on. <laughs> Go away, Siri. <laughs> Oh, Siri wants to listen for music now. No, go away. Um, so there's been a couple of times where, well, for instance, I heard this this sort of hard rock and hair metal kind of thing the other day, and the solo came on, and yeah, there's so many guys that could play a million miles an hour, but this was really clean and, and fast. I was like, hello, who's this? And it turned out to be Rat, and I'd never heard Rat before but i, I know um warren D. Martini is yeah player. yeah yeah and I, i've seen dave friedman's friends with, with warren i've seen him posting pictures out having dinner with him and steve stevens and that was the first time i actually heard warren D. Martini. It's like ah okay i get it that that's really cool and there's been a yeah, whole bunch funny. of bands like that yeah and it's funny you find them later on sometimes don't you as mm. well you know like mm. yeah it, but but i remember him always being a good player i wasn't really a big fan of rat though so that didn't really but but i always remember reading that he was roommates with jakey lee and i was a huge still am huge jakey lee fan right in his aussie years and badlands which i just thought was the most underrated great hard rock band at that time I got to see him live and they were just incredible, you know. So, uh, but it's funny. I remember from reading like Kerrang magazine and all these like old metal magazines that that Jakey Lee and Warren D. Martini would trade licks in their bedroom and stuff. You know, these things are all just stuck in there. It's funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was a good player. Last time I saw Warren D. Martini, he was actually turned up at a uh, at a Dweezil Zappa show and got up and jammed. Oh, nice. That yeah, pretty cool. Yeah. I have seen him. Uh, he was in White Snake for a little while, and when they toured Australia, that would have been early nineties, I'd say. Yeah. So I did see him then, um, but yeah, it's just there's a whole bunch of players that I'd, I'd only ever read about, but I hear on the radio, like you say. Yeah. Um, funnily and enough, those players, those players as well. Like, like there seems like there was a bit of a golden period there. I mean, it gets lumped in. People put all those sort of hair metal together and stuff like that. But when you look at some of those players, you know, like Nuno, obviously, Vito Brato was another one. He was a superb player. You know, there's so many of those players that that really had quite a nice voice on the instrument. Even though they played fast, they were quite melodic players, you know, and I think people think back and they lump it all in together. But sometimes it's worth revisiting that stuff because there's some really good players in there. You know? And at the end of the day, that's what sets people apart, you know. Um, I know so many guys that can outshred me by far, I, I don't consider myself that um, deeply rooted in shred style, but a lot of those guys don't play nice melodies or yeah. use motifs or things like that in their playing, and it's one of those things. It's like, okay, you can run, but you can't walk. Um, so it's you're absolutely right, and it's funny. I was talking, I was talking to some other guitar players about this last week, and and it, it's interesting because. I think it's a sign of the times in a way that, you know, the, the YouTube, Instagram, TikTok generation kind of thing. Um, the, the technique that some of these kids have is mind blowing. I mean, I wouldn't, I couldn't get anywhere near it, even if I tried, mind blowing. But having said that, I'm not hearing a lot of songwriting and I'm not hearing a lot of, like you say, like motifs in the solos. My, my favorite guitar player growing up, still is, was Gary Moore. Right, I absolutely love Gary Moore. Now, in America, people know Gary Moore for the blues, but in in Europe, it was the rock years. Yeah, you know, like yeah. Crazy onwards and 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 I mean, he could he could tread for sure. But when there was always a cool melody, always you know, great vibrato, lot, lots of touch, you know. So, and and a lot of those players that that I got into when I went back to to sort of find their roots, and I discovered Jeff Beck, Richie Blackmore. I mean, these are guys to me that have that. You know, I mean, they're not fast players, but they have, there's just, there's such an attitude in the playing. And Jeff Beck's a master of touch, you know, and tone and all that. But, but, you know, so I, it's, and then I always really appreciated the guys that could 
burn you know lukather i'm a big lukather fan you know and all, and, and and but again lukather could burn but great melodies really nice note choices mm. you know so yeah for me it's got to be I'm, I'm all right with a bit of speed i uh, i enjoy it when people can do it but i it has to be serving the solo or ha- or linking together some melodic stuff you know basically you've got to feel something from it, you yeah know? Absolutely, and serve the song and yeah. building up to that point. Yeah, there's there's times where I see guys take a solo and they'll start off just going hell for leather straight up, and and I just sit there and go, "Where do you go from there, man?" Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Unless you yeah. have some something that is just mind blowing that no one has ever seen or heard before, where are you going to go from there? Yeah. You've started out at the climax, and then we're just going kind to of whittle down to nothingness. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Especially, especially if you're in sort of a, if your if your solo is a thirty second or a forty five second solo segment in a song as opposed to an instrumental, then you really got to try and tell a story. You know, like I mm. said, I was really, really into Queen growing up, and even though Brian May wasn't a technical player. I loved his solos and his melodic parts, you know, because yeah. and like such great vibrato and feel, you know, just really, really nice. Absolutely. So, Rob, I, I jumped, to the, I jumped the gun a little bit there, mate. You were saying yeah. about when you first started. Um, yeah. What was your first electric guitar? <laughs> and did you get an electric guitar so, early on in the piece, or did you start out on a, an acoustic no, or a classic? I did start on electric, but you you'll laugh. It, it, it was from a British company called Axe, which is pretty rock, right? Axe. And it was it was red, and it had the word Axe <laughs> in huge letters written on it. And the action was just, I mean, like, you know, it sort of had snow on it. It was so high, you know. It's like, I mean, I can't believe I was even able to play a chord on the thing, let alone... But uh, but so that was the first one. And I think what my mum and dad were doing was, let's see how he does with that. If he takes to it, we'll upgrade, which is a good way to do it. You yep. know, you don't you, know, you can't you can't start off with a with a <laughs> three thousand dollar guitar. You know? So start off on that axe and, and cutting my fingers up. But I was still loving it. You know, I, I, right from the start. I had that thing where, it was, like I say, that emotional, physical connection with it. I would, just, I could just sit there and play a chord and feel good about it, you know. So, so was, of course, the problem was though, I didn't come in. Like, I wish I'd come into the guitar and heard, you know, like, like maybe, you know, there was pop music around. Maybe if I if I'd made that my starting point, it would have been realistic. But I, I come into the guitar and I want to be able to play all of the Blizzard of Oz album, all the Randy Rhodes solos, and I want to play Fair Warning, I want to play all Eddie's, you know, and it's just completely ridiculous to be trying to play it, like, you know, but that yeah. was where I started, so that was, I guess in some ways it was a good uh, learning curve, you know. Yeah. But yeah. anyway, so I had that one, and I think I had that one for probably maybe a year and a half or two years, and then my next one, the upgrade, was a Charvette, by Charvel. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah, so, I do. Yeah, I do. Like their baby company. That was a great guitar, because mostly because the action was lower. You know, that's really all, you know, that's really all it took. You yeah. Know. Yeah. But that, and what, so what amp were you playing through? Um, oh, it would have just been like crappy little practice amp. I think Axe had its own amp with it. And then I think I got a, there was like a little PV little pv thing that sounded terrible I'm sure. i think we all had little pvs back in the day i think we did all have little pvs yeah they were, they yeah. The were the pv brand the only pv that used to show up a few years later was that classic 13 that wasn't a bad little lamp that mm. one but mm. uh, but no i would have had just a solid state horrible sounding little thing with a couple of boss pedal i'm sure i'm sure the tone was just horrendous <laughs> i think back and i was using a, a pv studio pro 60 which was a little right. it had a single 12 inch speaker on it uh i had a boss heavy metal pedal yes i think that's why i had the black one with the orange yeah. right yeah. yeah and yeah. when i think back now that could not be further from what i look for in a in a guitar tone of course. Of course. um yeah. all that you know it i like, like to our tone went like that didn't it back then? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah and I, I think back to the music i was playing then just in my band and that was a very inappropriate pedal to be using, and I guess I just didn't know it. And I'm still in that search for that that perfect overdrive pedal, but <laughs> I prefer I've to have got, a good amp. Yeah, I've got. I've got, just to sidetrack for a second. I, I've also been on that search for <laughs> thirty years, and and the one I like best is the Manitone Red Snapper. That's my recommendation for you. Yeah, and you, you'll, I actually got this one from Australia because they're quite hard to find now. Okay, let me tell you, a Manitone? 
when a tone is the company yeah, yeah. And, and the pedal is the red snapper and this is the red snapper mark three red so, snapper yeah. mark three i found this one on reverb uh, in australia so that was where, where i got it from but yeah that, that that's you know but again the thing is you have to be careful recommending pedals to people because it's subjective isn't it you know and it also it really depends on what amp you're playing through and what guitar as well absolutely absolutely i've um I've been trying to find now my my amp of choice is the Friedman small box. Uh, yeah, and I just think that's a fantastic amp. The Plexi channel on that, I'm not one for pristine cleans. I like to have it yep. be on the verge of breakup. So I just wind back the volume oh so slightly on that and I get the yep. best tone. Unfortunately, I sold mine a couple of years ago uh, to fund a, a trip, funnily enough, to go hang out with Dave Friedman in Germany. Uh, oh, and I've right. been wanting to get one again since, but uh, I'm not sure if you're aware that Batik Amps Distribution had a big fire in the past year. Yeah, and terrible yeah. fire. So yeah. they're just getting yeah. back on top of things now with at the new factory, and I'm waiting to get another small box, custom one, of course, through Dave. But um, yeah. in the meantime, I picked up one of those little Double J Juniors, the Jerry Cantrell head, uh-huh. and the Dirty Channel is just everything I could ever want. But the clean, it's it's not like the the, the Plexi Channel on the small box. So I've got a small box pedal. And I'm trying to use that with the right. clean channel to get the tones that I'm used to. And it sounds phenomenal through certain amps. And then you plug it into another amp and you're like, oh, okay. And I find that with all my overdrives. I've got a whole bunch of them I there. Find that too. I find that too. Yeah. I what works with one amp. And that's, yeah. And it's some, that's such another. a tricky part of, you know, like you go on, if you go on YouTube and you watch, you know, some great uh, amp. Uh, pedal pedal demo and then yeah, that's exactly it it's very difficult to to match pedal with amp it's yeah i mean that's more of a problem than people realize i think yeah yeah well my plan for uh future overdrive demos uh is to get the synergy system uh you're familiar mm-hmm. with synergy with their oh, modules yeah, yep yeah. yeah and have a, a vox style preamp a, a fender style preamp and a marshall style so i can show people how yeah. it sounds with each yeah, one exactly. because um like we were saying, it sounds drastically different from amp to amp. Yeah. Yeah. So, Rob, how how at what point did you start playing in a band? Was it much? Yeah. Okay. Good question. So, so I played I played for a couple of years, um, going from you know the axe to the to the um, Charvet, and at that point. I was um, I was getting those. You remember in the guitar? Uh, I love guitar magazines still to this day. But I have a real fondness for like you know the eighties guitar magazines and all that. And I've still got a ton of them. I mean, I'm shipped all around the world with me. You know, like, yeah. Uh, but but um, they had those note for note transcription cassettes in the back of those. So what I would do is I would pick you know an Aussie album, a Van Halen album, a Gary Moore album, and I, that's how I would learn. You know, I would, yep. I would play along with those. You know, and then of course I would actually use records where i didn't have those and do it the old-fashioned way and actually you know figure stuff out so i did that for a long time um and then in my town where i grew up which is margate which is a tiny little seaside town in the southeast there was one there were were lots of pubs because it's england but there was one particular pub that was for all of the rockers in the town right and so the rest of the pubs not so much you know but this one pub you know, everybody had long hair and wore the denim and, and like had all the patches of their favorite bands and all that, you know. So that's kind of where we started hanging out. And in England, you start going to the pub when you're very young. I'm sure it's probably similar where you are as well. So, you know, and so we would see these rock bands there. So we would form bands and play in this pub and, you know, oh, I'll play bass for you. Oh, you play guitar for me kind of thing, a bit of that. So that was kind of the first thing. And then I joined this band, um, my, called the Cosmic Angels, and uh, they were sort of like a Faith No More style band, oh, cool. except it was, except it was all original music. So it had yeah. a bit of like had a bit of attitude to it. It was quite heavy, but it had keyboards as well, you know. And the first gig I played was at a biker festival when I was um, when I was about uh, seventeen, going on eighteen, and uh, yeah, it was t- I was terrified, absolutely terrified. And uh, we start playing our Faith No More style original music, and they're all shouting like. Yeah, play some rock. Yeah, but they wanted to hear, you know, classic rock and blues songs. We knew about three, so we threw a couple of those in, and that that sort of got us out of there without them killing us. But that was my first gig was at that biker festival, um, and then and then you know I played a few a few more gigs around that pub and that kind of thing, and then um, I managed. I saw an advert in the paper 
for a band and it was a, a funk pop band and you know i wasn't entirely sure what funk was at that point although i did own some prince records so i think i was kind of you know getting in there but um but i went and met with them and they were an original band they were split in two they would do original gigs and and they were going to record an album and do all that and then they would also do cover gigs under a you know at some of the local pubs as well just to play you know so i ended up auditioning for them and i got that gig when was that that would have been um early 90s i guess and and then i was uh and i played with them for about seven years um and and we used to we used to go up to london and do showcase gigs uh you know and for the labels and and we used to um play the colleges the college circuit and all that which is really fun and the thing that was great about it was they were much better musicians than I was, you know, because I was I was coming at it from I want to be Joe Satriani and they were coming at it from, you know, we're going to play music that's like U2 and more refined. And it was a completely different world to me. And it was great for me. And it was like a lot of funk. So I had to work on that. Um, so, yeah, I did that for years with them. It was great. Really, really loved it. You know, it, it always pays to uh, surround yourself with good musicians, people that are better than you. Yeah. Always. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's, I, I avoid going to jam nights, and I know, and and I don't want to sound too pompous to up myself, but <laughs> I want to be surrounded by good and keeps keep me on my toes. And like, yeah. whoa, yeah, that that guy, I, I need to up the game to be, you know, not surround myself yeah. with bedroom guys that it's like yeah yeah that, that's okay and yeah they'll, they'll sing all the praises to you but yeah to to play with guys who are better than you really makes you up your game huh it does and and you know like when you're going up to london and doing these showcases and you're doing a, a you know six or seven song set you've got to be tight and you've got to know your parts and you, you can't and you've got to get some stage presence happening because you're performing then it's, it's a whole different thing to, and then we will go and do the local pub gigs where it's more of a laugh you know but yeah. just just doing that i think really really good to sort of you know get in and actually writing parts and then of course that was the first time i went into a recording studio we did a couple of albums and you know, so that was great. That was really, really experienced. Made a video uh, on a uh, soundstage in London. You know, it was all really, really cool stuff. And while I was doing that, but I've always been somebody that can't just do one thing. I always musically want to be doing a couple of things. To this day, I always like to have a couple of things going. So I did an acoustic duo because I have this singer-songwriter side of myself. And I love, I love singer-songwriters as well as all the guitar music. You know, I'm a big Joni Mitchell fan and I'm a massive Neil Finn, Crowded House fan. You know, yeah. I love that band. And yeah. so, and so, you know, I did an acoustic duo with harmony vocals at the same time I was doing that. And then I, and then I formed uh, or joined a, uh, a hard rock band. So I had those three going for a little while, you know, and then I went, while I went to university, I was doing the three bands, which was a lot, but it was, you know, good, good to be doing it. So you, you just mentioned university. Was that yeah. to study music? Yeah, I did. Well, it was kind of a, it was a war, really watered down the music part of it. It was mostly like a, a media thing, radio, film, television, they called it when you make, you make films and, and, and stuff like that. And it was okay. I spent most of my time studying music, not really what the school was doing because the school's music level was very basic. I was actually, I took a private teacher and started. So while I was doing my degree, I was doing that on the side uh studying for me you know for music so i was kind of doing both um but and it's funny actually like that band that i was with for seven years i picked the university so we could keep the band together oh cool <laughs> so, yeah, yeah it's cool i don't know if that's cool i guess it's cool yeah so that was that was pretty funny but uh, yeah. okay but, so now you find yourself actually teaching at um the musicians institute which yeah, yeah. is almost you know, i mean you could say that it's, it's like a university but just dedicated to yeah individual instruments right with people who really know their stuff yeah how does one go from playing in in the bands and and going to university yourself to being a teacher at the musicians institute well there's quite a big bit in between where where i i mean i i started t taking on private students when i was at university as well so i've been teaching from then like you know mid 90s to now and my teaching has involved you know, a couple of schools, um, tons and tons of private students, uh, all the true fire stuff for 10 years. And so lots of different 
I, I was pretty experienced doing lots of different teaching by the time I got because I've been at MI for four years, so it's fairly new in the okay, yep, know, in, yep, in the scheme of things. But yeah, it's a great question because it's you have to you have to. I also like I, I'd written a book as well that I draw from and and stuff. So you know, it, it's um, I had the same thing you had though growing up. I I thought GIT sounded like the most magical place ever, you know, and it and it is, you know, and it is. It's not it's not quite that GIT now though. To be honest with you, it's it's moved on a bit, you know, and it's and the entry level is not what it once was, you know, like you know, it's it's all about to, uh, you know, it's it's they've got bills to pay, <laughs> so, yeah. so yeah. You know, if you if you pay your tuition, you were in the school basically. Right. Yep. Uh, but but uh, should I say that I already did? But <laughs> <laughs> but but you know, um, I, I mean, like you, I dreamed of going there, you know, and it wasn't impossible for where I came from and all that, you know, to get there. Oh but, man, um, some of the people but, that I saw that were teaching oh, there, you know, like, yeah. what I can get one-on-one lessons from Paul Gilbert? Well, yeah, and the and the people and the people that that teach there to this day are incredible, absolutely incredible. You know, it's like you walk past one of the rooms and you listen to like. Sid Jacobs, the jazz guitarist, or Dan Gilbert, one of these guys, you know, and it's like, wow, you know, I mean, these guys, you know, it's it's pretty cool, uh, great environment. Um, but um, yeah, so so it was kind of like, you know, you go in and 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 I had a, I knew um, one of the guys that was running the guitar department, and we had, you know, we went in and interviewed and did test lessons and all that, and you know, so they ended up teaching classes and private lessons. And all that kind of stuff, some master classes. And and at the moment I'm I'm remote because we shut down for COVID. And and even though the school has opened again, my schedule's so busy with uh private lessons and some of the other stuff that I'm just doing remote, but I'm gonna go back to the school probably in the summer. Yeah, uh, right. To get back on campus. But uh, yeah, but I but the remote lessons are cool too, because students from all over the world doing doing MI online as it's called. You know. Okay. But, yeah, it's, it's it's a pretty interesting thing too because MI does use a curriculum and in in my teaching for the last you know 30 years I I make an individual plan for each person it doesn't matter if they're a beginner or you know I always I always because I don't believe in that one size fits all for guitar players thing you know yeah. if you want to if you want to if your life's goal is to is to play Pink Floyd style solos. It's not going to make sense if I start teaching you country, is it? You know. So yeah, it's yeah. Like, now, obviously, you have to have fundamentals that go across different genres. But I do try to keep my lessons, you know, in line with what what people are interested in. And so, MI is really interesting because there is a main curriculum, a technique curriculum, and a music reading curriculum, and and then they do all these performance classes as well. So you you get a great blend. And one of my favorite things about MI is you'll see a you'll see a kid that's come from Brazil and he's a total metalhead, right? Yeah. And at the end of his first year, he's like, "Oh, now I'm listening to acid jazz and I'm really digging it." And I love that. I mean, to me, that is one of the coolest things because when you when you're in that environment of the school, how can you not be influenced by all of these other students and teachers that are, you know, I mean, like there's every musical genre you can think of there, you know. So that I think is just wonderful. That that's great because as I yeah. said to you uh, before we went on air um yeah. anybody that plays different to me a different style to me is yeah. fascinating to me that that just sounds great you know i um i'm a bit sick of people who play like me you know really, three note per string yeah. runs and it's, <laughs> right, yeah that right. that post van halen thing it's been milked to death yeah. and you just want to hear something different so to be in an environment where you're exposed to all those different styles uh yeah. and having instructors that can help guide you if you're like hey rob I heard this really cool gypsy jazz thing, man. How, how do I get right. into that? You know, um, right? What a great environment! And you totally yeah. and read my mind. I was about to ask you whether there is a curriculum that you teach from, or whether you individually per per student uh, design something, which is a lot of work, but it's a lot more uh, fruitful in the end, isn't it? To I think so. You know, I mean, I have I have students I've I've had for you know eight, nine years that were still going, you know, and that's, that's nice. You know, you really get to, to know them well and, and, and guide them kind of thing, you know, but at the same time, I mean, I do wish, but like, I would say, I would say the one area that I was lacking in, in the early years was having a, a good technique foundation, which is funny in a way, because I was trying to play Randy Rhodes and Jakey e. Lee and Gary Moore, but, but you know what I mean? Like I really like that, the, the teaching the MI technique curriculum means I have to get myself in gear, you know, because it's like, you know, you've got to know your stuff if you're going to teach that stuff, you know. Yeah, so yeah. I think that's that's really good as well. 
Another thing I think is really interesting is that, and I see this, we do these, we do these faculty forum. Uh, I've got one coming up um, in February, I think, where one of the teachers in the guitar department gives a masterclass and it's to the students, but some of the other teachers drop in. And it's really interesting because we find out that a lot of us take different approaches to get to the same point. Yep. You know, like some people are really into the cage system. I like the cage system, for example. Some people are really not. Some people like three note per string. Some people are really like, it's so interesting. But, and, and some people have different names for the same scales. Or, you know, just about how, how we get to this point. And this is sort of like the big question for a lot of us as guitar players, isn't it? You know, and I think the answer to it is you've got to find one or two things that make crystal clear sense for you personally for you yep. and just make that what you just you know get it to the point where it's just cold and you just don't because i think the thing i see a lot is that people overthink everything yeah. and you can hear them especially thinking when they're playing, playing through, yeah especially if you're playing through chord changes it's so easy to overthink it right? yeah yeah <laughs> yeah. So, yeah you know that it's funny um you're saying about fretboard navigation basically and that's something i like yeah. to ask people how they sure. view the fretboard because um for the longest time, man, I knew my safe pentatonic shape. Hey, we're playing in A minor. Watch me totally milk the crap out of the fifth fret, but be completely lost anywhere else kind of thing, right? Um, and I was like that. And I was playing in a, a Queen tribute band for a few years. Oh, nice. and a, a really, really good one. Like the lead singer looked exactly like Freddie Mercury. And man, I'm, oh. I... Looked exactly like Brian. Mate. People would, would lose their shit. We'd walk out on stage and you just see the look on people's faces like, how is that not Queen? Oh, my God. But if ever I took an extended solo and I'd sort of try and break out of my little box, I was mm. just landing on way too many wrong notes and I'd see mm. YouTube videos. I'd you know check out, oh, did anybody film that? And I'd just see myself eating shit way too much. And that's where it, that was the point where I thought, I need to learn the fretboard better. I've milked the crap out of this. People assume that I know all over and I don't. So I started asking people, yeah, how do you view the fretboard? And it's really funny how everybody's different. And yeah. you mentioned the cage system. There's three note per string. Some people learn their scales and they think more in numbers, but they travel up one string. Um, there's so many different approaches to it. Um, what's your go-to? Because you did say that um, – to find that one thing that works for you. Yeah. Um, what is it's your funny, approach? It's not necessarily static either, because in recent years, I've sort of changed my approach that I've been doing for a long time as well. I think, it, I, I think it's sort of organic. It keeps moving a little bit, you know? Um, but the, I, I would say one of the big um, light bulb moments pretty early on when I started filming courses for true fire, we had, we had some meetings and I said, I want to do this a series on caged because I'm really interested in it and they were they were cool with that so I did like three or four caged courses and and I got a lot of feedback from people that were like this has really changed my life which is really nice you know mm -hmm. uh, but but a big one for me like let's take your a minor pentatonic for a moment right so the big thing I would see with students is they they'd have what they would call shape one the fifth mm -hmm. fret you know and they would have shape two which they know kind of like that Albert King bit you know like the top three strings yep and then yep. it all gets a bit wobbly for the next two shapes right? that's that was and, me and, and so what I would have said to that younger version of you is I would have said where's your A minor chords you know because once you see because uh, it, it's such a I mean I learned it the same way you do I learned it just those five shapes and the thing that confused me so much that I didn't realize until I figured it out is that those shapes start from the low E string, all of them, right? They don't start from the root of the chord. And this is, this is like, once I realized that, you know, if you were going to play, let's say you're up at the 12th fret and you're going to play an A minor pentatonic, don't start it on the E, start it on the A, right? And then when you run that shape up at that 12th fret, it looks like the cage shape there, which is actually a C minor shape. And before you know it, just running the scale, you hear the intervals, right? And you and you hear, oh, there's a root, there's a minor third, there's a fifth, there's a flat seven. And, and I mean, even if you don't know what they are yet, you're hearing music. That scale immediately becomes musical. It's like you're playing a lick instead of a scale. Yeah. Whereas if you play the six string versions, we were all taught, that doesn't sound musical at all, does it? So yeah. that little adjustment, you know, basically each of the five pentatonic shapes and that could be 
major or minor scale as well, any of the modes, it works for any scale. But each of the five shapes, if you relate it to its cage chord and play the scale from the root of the cage chord, it changes it changes your whole perspective on it. And, and that was kind of how I did it for a very long time. I've since kind of broken it down to the fact that, you know, you still need that for all of your chord and rhythm work. Um, but you could take those five shapes and actually break them down to two for the whole neck. And this is kind of a, a new little thing I'm working on. I've sent, I've done some lessons on it for my Patreon people and stuff. I might write another book on it because it's quite an yeah. interesting yeah. idea. But, but basically, you can get those five shapes down to two. But but where I would say to someone to start would be to to really look at the five cage major and minor triads and and link that up with the pentatonic. If you know a couple of pentatonic shapes. Uh, or even all five, link them up to those chords and play the scale from the root note of the chord. And, and it will change the way you play. It really will, you know. And then it's very, and, and my whole thing is is building in stages. So if you play an A minor triad, you got three notes, right? And then you go, okay, I'm going to add the, I'm going to add the seven. So that's a, a flat seven, right? So now you've got an A minor seven. That's four notes. Now I'm going to play a minor pentatonic scale. And what am I adding in there? A fourth. That's five notes. Now I'm going to add uh, the ninth because the ninth or the second is a beautiful chord extension. That's six notes. That's a hexatonic. Now I'm going to put the six in. I'm either going to play it flat, which is the natural minor scale, which is your go-to rock scale, or I'm going to play it as a natural six. And that's Dorian, which is a little bit more fusion-y, right? Now I've got seven. And then, let like, you see what I'm doing? I'm going three, four, yep. five, six. And, and, and you would do that over the course of a year, right? Let's say one note at a time. Let's really hear it. Let's really hear what it does to the chord, what it does. And that, so, and also making the visualization of where you see your chord with where those intervals are. I mean, intervals are everything, right? Is what we come to find out, I think. Yep. And then putting those chord extensions in. Yeah, I mean, that's simplifying it, but that kind of approach, building it up stage by stage, because, you know, I would I would open up one of those, like, remember that book called The Guitar Grimoire or The Scale, whatever, right? Like, yep. You open these books up in the 80s and it's just like, you know, hundreds of scale diagrams, right? Yep. And you'd run the scale, but are you really hearing what that scale sounds like against the chord? No. Are you really hearing where the intervals are in it? Not really, right? It just looks cool because you're doing that, right? Yeah. But it's so so my thing is, at least for me, I'm very slow at internalizing. I've noticed like it takes my ear a while to internalize a sound. So I like to do it like that. Spend a load of time on three notes and then go four, five, and gradually and each in each cage position. You know, and then gradually the whole fretboard starts to light up. You know, at least it has for me. And the other thing I would say, I'm sorry, I don't mean to go on too long. On You're this, right. No, no. The, other, the other thing I would say is that rhythm playing is so overlooked. It's crazy, right? I mean, you, you play 80%. Of the time you're playing rhythm, right? More, and yet I more. See, I tell people ninety five percent of the time. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and, and yet I see guitar players with two bar chord shapes, and that's it. You know, and I go, okay, you know, you've got to be able to play. If you pick up three simple chords, like maybe maybe two, mate, like I don't know, G D C or G D A minor, right? G D A minor. You need to be able to play G D A minor in at least three places on the guitar on different string sets on three strings at a time and once you start to do that you see voice leading you see where all of those you know we were talking earlier about the uh the cool hendrix uh pearl jam kind of guitar parts you see where all of that stuff comes from as soon as you get out of these big shapes and you take it down to three strings and you and you you start adding uh you know those little double stops and slides and embellishments all that style that to me as a kid seemed like it was so mysterious yeah right? absolute voodoo I can't, yeah absolute voodoo right i know how to play a power chord it doesn't sound like that yeah you know? yeah but once you go on that cage journey and you do that and i say to people and they go yeah but how do you retain it and i go oh, take a song you know the chords to i, I use little wing as an example because it's got a nice blend of major and minor chords and i go you should be able to play little wing on three strings across four frets in different spots on the guitar yeah. right so go away and do that and if you're having trouble seeing where the cage chord comes from look for your nearest root note like oh i can't find b minor look for a b make the big bar chord then you know and 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 it's a process and what's cool about it is i think it's fun because you get a real sense of achievement every time you can play a new song 
a song that you already know somewhere else on the neck and you'll find your start, you know, suddenly you go, oh, I see what The Edge was doing now, yeah. you know, oh, yeah. I see what Jimmy did there. You Absolutely. Know, you start to kind of yeah. come about. So that's kind of how I do it. It's funny, Rob. Um, I went on that journey probably about 15 years ago with the, the different chord shapes. I was uh, I was started yeah. to do some shows around town with a friend of mine who plays acoustic guitar and sings. He normally does solo gigs. Yeah. Uh, when he needed to do a duo, I thought, yeah, I'll jump in and nice and easy. And okay, so he's playing strumming open position. And I started thinking, well, I'm going to play different. And this is where, around the time I was learning the cage system as well, where there's five ways to play every chord. And I would try and just play what he's playing but different inversions and then move its way up the neck. And I still yeah. do that. If I'm doing a really boring cover gig um, and – okay, so a song like I Will Survive, you know, the right. Right. yeah Gloria Gaynor. I, I play yeah. in this little um, cover band which has a male and a female singer and the female will do that song and it's the same chord progression all the way through. A minor, D minor, yeah. G, C, F, B, 7, sharp – Five, whatever that's called, the Hendrix chord <laughs> down to yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I'll start off doing that, and after a few rounds, I go, okay, let's start climbing the neck, playing the same chords, and it's and it's an exercise. I'm actually thinking I could either be sitting here thinking, oh man, I hate playing this song, how boring, or I could be teaching myself right now, and that's exactly what I do: is try and find different inversions. In a given position, let's play all this around the, the fifth fret. Okay, let's go up a position. Let's play it all around there. Let's go up another position and just keep climbing. And it's a perfect way to practice what you've been saying uh, without practicing and putting so time aside to actually knuckle down because nobody wants to sit there and play the boring stuff. But when you're forced to, mm. you may as well be learning something out of it at the same time, huh? Yeah, I mean, I think that's brilliant. And and also, you're also hearing it in the context with a rhythm section as mm. well. Because mm. like some of those, the great thing about some of those little chanky chords, you know, like when they're on the top three strings is they fit so well when you've got other instruments going on, whereas those big ones don't, yeah, you know. Absolutely. Um, I did, it's, funny, it's always funny you say that because when I first moved to America, um, I the first band I joined because I, I needed to work, so, so I started teaching and I also... Um, just look for a band you know the first band i joined was a, a show band and it was a funk soul band and not much not much lead guitar in that on that gig at all and that's actually i did exactly what you just said which is really funny that's really where i put that stuff together before i started teaching it was on that was on the bandstand because we used to play a lot of gigs so yeah i did the same thing and it was all you know earth wind and fire and all that kind of stuff and it was it was fun stuff yeah. but there was a lot of repetition Yep. You know, so, yeah, so, and you might as well use that that time to, well to to yeah. improve your playing. And you were just saying about rhythm guitar being an, an overlooked yeah. thing, and yeah. it is such a big thing. I I know so many guys that can out shred me, but you go to play the song, and I'm thinking, why does that sound terrible? Like it, it, it's yeah. not hard, man. And I actually my my flatmate Nathan, he he doesn't play guitar. He's not a musician in the slightest. Yeah. But um, I was talking about this to him the other day and i used the song by green day the good riddance time of your life you know the acoustic right yeah yeah my halfway into there's like a, a solo section a, a violin kind of section right halfway mm. into that you listen to billy joe and he starts laying it down with mm. confidence and we're just talking g c add nine d kind of stuff yeah. right but i was showing it to my flatmate and i said listen to this man i I can't tell you five guys that can do that. Mm -hmm. He's like, what? I said, listen, just listen to him play there. Like, and mm -hmm. I had to sort of play along to show him what I meant, just the confidence of yeah. there's no drummer playing, but who needs one right now? Because I'm showing yeah. you where that beat is and yeah. I'm not, yeah. you know, I'm confident. Bam, bam, bam. And that is so overlooked, man. I And I say that, I, I struggle to think of five guys that I know that can play rhythm guitar I that think, good. I think part of that comes from doing a lot of gigs with drummers. And that's one thing, again, like, not, you know, like I said, there's incredible players out there these days, new young players. But I do worry a little bit about they haven't been around the country in a van playing gigs, right? And, and it's like, you know, like, like sometimes we get some guys through MI to give masterclasses and they're kind of 
some of them are quite quite big names and they've never plugged into a real valve amp tube amp they've only ever used a Kemper in their whole life right and which is really so funny you know so and, and and some of them have never played with like acoustic drums and it's just shocking to me you know and it's but it's like I think that what you're describing because when he was recording that song there's no way he was thinking about what he was doing he was just feeling it right yep. when he was just laying that I mean I'm assuming he was just yep. laying that down and I think that's part of it I think when you do all these gigs you know when I when I I formed a band after the soul funk band I formed my own band and we used to do about 220 gigs a year which is a lot <laughs> you know and we go we go up and down through the through the middle and the south of you know of the US and everything and and but one thing that doing that teaches you as long as you've got a decent drummer you do need a decent drummer if your drummer's all over the place it's not going to work but if you play with a decent drummer there's really no substitute for that I don't think you know into like you can sit there with a metronome for so long but it's different it's 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 because you've got to have that internal pulse and be able to subdivide and feel it you know and it's uh, yeah you know you, you mentioned earlier that when you started that you yeah. drums was something that you you thought yeah. you were gonna you take oh, on. I, love drums. I, I was the yeah. same before i played guitar oh. i um i was fascinated with um uh, synthesizers there was that tv yeah. show fame do you remember? Oh yeah, yeah. And yeah. I wanted to be Bruno, man. I, that how, how can oh, yeah. one guy have these keyboards yeah. and drum machines and stuff and sound like that? I want to do that. Um, and have you then, ever noticed? That, have you ever noticed that Bruno looks a bit like Joe Satriani when he had hair? I'm just going to put that out there. So, yeah. yes, he does. <laughs> hey, hey, when I was talking to Steve Stevens, he mentioned yeah. he went to the Fame School. That was actually a school, the, oh, the School of Performing really? Arts in New York. Oh. He went there. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Yeah, uh, but okay. So I was fascinated with synthesizers and drums, and so I I got an, an organ. Uh, Mum got me an organ to, to start playing, and that had a drum machine in it. So from a, a young age, I was playing with machines, and I'm very picky when it comes to drummers because I've been playing to machines for a long time, and I've been yeah. head head deep in into production for the longest time and programming. I, I forgot about being a, a guitar player for a while and was just programming beats and all that kind of thing. But I think that goes a long way in the rhythm playing. Just um, I'm no flash drummer. I can't play any fills or anything, but give me a set of sticks and just play a straight yeah. beat. I'm constantly amazed at the amount of guys, just like on guitar, who can play all the fancy stuff on the drums, get them to play a straight beat, and you think, are you, are you taking the piss right now, or you you just don't have the clock to do that? Oh, yeah. geez, and it's it's shocking. So most guys I know who can play rith really good rhythm guitar, give them a set of drumsticks, and they'll be able to play you a really good beat on the on the drums yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. Are, are you the same? Can you can you, you play drums? I, I, can, I can I can keep a beat, but I the problem with drums is I I love drums too much. And so I start to think I need to play some crazy fill. And by the time the fill's ended, the song's over, you know, so <laughs> I, I get, I'm, I'm like a, I'm like a nine year old. If you give me a drum drumstick, so that's the problem, yeah. you know, but I, I, but I can feel what needs to be there. You know, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm a huge, huge drummer fan as well. Like, like, you know, I'll, I'll buy albums just because of certain drummers being on them, you know, like one of my favorites talking about straight beat is Jeff Picaro, who I think was just, ridiculous you know yep. and as i didn't didn't need to overplay or you know it's like steve gad jeff Picard, all these guys are just like oh my goodness but it just feels so good you know it's just yeah. you just yeah. you just feel it yeah know? and, and it's, a, it's a hard thing like you said if your drummer isn't any good wow you the band's not going to sound yeah. any good no uh, yeah it's yeah. funny you mentioned the, the synthesizers because when i was at, at university i ended up scoring for a, a, some films and I was using a Korg M1. Do you remember those? I, I love that thing. So, yep. Yeah. So I, I was pretty into the synth stuff too. You know, uh -huh. I uh, I made jingles for a living for for a few oh, years. Man. I worked at a, a place, um, London Music Group, which had nothing to do with London. Um, it was just a, a name. But uh, my studio there, I had an M1 that I was just using as a controller keyboard. Um, and everything else was in Pro Tools just to recall factor. Um but yeah, used to have a, an M1 sitting there. Never really got to play with the internal sounds, but um, you know, oh, you know, I mean, that was a really good way to um, not get too personal when it comes to writing songs. I think a lot of people 
even when they're writing um, solos and things, they th- they're overthinking it. When you work in a, in a jingle house and you need to write and produce six um, jingles a week, you soon learn that the first thing that pops into your head is the right thing and not to overthink it, you know. Um, I, I mean, I couldn't agree more. And how, how I got to learn that was I, I did some sessions. I did I did some work at um, Bad Robot here, the J.J. Abrams studio, you know, uh, and, and The Village, which was a thrill because that's where they recorded all the Steely Dan albums. You know, oh, cool. Was, so, so I would do some of those sessions. Same thing. you got to come up with it quick, just do yep. it. And, you, yep. and most of the time, the first idea was the best idea. Now, come to my own music and I've had to give myself a bit of a talking to because it's not difficult for me to record 70 takes of something, you know, and, and, but in recent years, cause I put out a lot of different music, um, instrumental stuff, fusion stuff, vocal pop, you know, whatever, all over the place. And, and, um, but I've, I've given myself a talking to and what I do now, if I'm trying to improvise a solo on one of my own songs, I'll do three takes. And then here's the big trick. I don't listen back. Right, I give it at least two days, and then when I come back, it's like listening to someone else. Because if I if I would have stayed there, I would have erased those three tracks, and I would have done eighty more. And I bet you, number one or two would have been the best one. I've learned that the hard way over the years. You know? Yeah, yeah. Actually, what what I often do is I'll come back, and there's three takes. I'll maybe comp something between the two, or I'll relearn, or I'll comp it, and then I'll relearn it and try and improv- and try and play it as a live take. But yep. I, I have no shame about doing the comp. You know? Yeah, that, <laughs> that's fine. what I do. That's what I do. Yeah, is, yeah, it's, uh, it's, yeah. I, I'll go back and um, listen to um, a few takes, maybe comp it, but then I can hear, usually if I'm improvising them, I can hear that I'm improvising and I'm not super confident where, yeah. oh man, when yeah. some guys do improvise, it's just like, what you just made that up right i can hear that i'm still feeling it out but i'll get the ideas comp it together and then learn it like you say so yes. play that with, with confidence it. absolutely absolutely yeah. but that whole yeah. thing of whatever the first thing especially with with jingles man um the company i worked for had a policy where you got uh, x amount of redos if you weren't happy uh you had to cap that because you would write the right thing the first time and right. Whoever at the company you were dealing with felt that they needed to put their fingerprint on it somehow and they would come mm-hmm. and, oh, I just want to change this word to this, completely ruin the rhyming scheme or any other meter or anything. And you're just like, uh, and you just knew. You go back and forth and by the time they've used up their last revision, they'll come back to you and go, you know what? You had it right the first time. And it's so hard to not say, yeah, no. <laughs> See, that's all, that sort of makes me wonder about, you know, you have all these classic albums that were recorded in, in the in the 70s or whatever. And, and you know, you hear, oh, they did that. They did that in three weeks on a, on a 16 track or something. And then you hear about albums that take three years and you wonder how much of that's going on, how much of the producer. I mean, sometimes producers can bring a lot to a project, no question. But other times it makes you wonder, like they, they've got to feel like they're putting their value in because they're getting paid for it. So it makes you wonder, doesn't it? You know, like how too many options, too many options is not a good thing. I was so much more prolific with my output of songs I was doing in the nineties when I just had a four track recorder Mm -hmm. that I would stripe one track with empty time code so that I could sync my Atari. So I've lost a track already. I've got three audio tracks and the rest would be MIDI, but I had a drum machine which had, five kick drum sounds. Now I now I have 5,000 kick drum sounds right. and could quite easily spend two days losing sight of the end goal by scrolling through 5,000 kick drum sounds. That's not being creative. Right. I need to just have a little folder with five good sounds, pick the best one, move on, uh, because, yeah, you can overthink. And funnily enough, working with people on their music – is a lot easier to see the forest for the trees, I guess. Um, and it's so hard to do with your own music. But listening to somebody else's song, I can quite easily go, that's great, but you need to jump to that bit there. There's four bars there that just isn't needed. I was waiting to go to that. yet, yeah. And they'll look at you and go, you're absolutely right. I would never have thought of that. But you're listening to it with fresh ears. And like you said, coming back a few days later and listening to it, a take, um, 
And yeah, it's almost yep. like that. You can't, you almost come back and listen to it like it's a session for someone else, you yep. know, yep. because you, you're because otherwise you're so close to it. It's like it's these. Really I, in all honesty, Rob, I don't watch these back, right? Because right, right. Yeah. if I did, oh, there's no way I'd be able to do this. I would have given yeah. up after five episodes and and gone, oh, I sound like an idiot. I I, I, I stutter and I stutter and stammer and and I keep cutting people off and oh oh oh. The key is yeah, not we, to, sometimes I'll get a question about one of my courses and, and someone will say. You know, in that video where you and I say, no, I don't, because like, you know, as long as as long as we get through the to the editing part, then I, I leave it to them and I don't I don't go back and check those. It's torture, really isn't want, it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I've had a few friends go, oh, man, I, I wish I could do that, but I just can't watch myself on video. Don't. <laughs> exactly. Don't. Do you find, do you find, so you know what you were saying about that, too many options? Yep. I find that with, I've you know, been on a long journey with guitar straight into the amp, a few pedals. I went through an even tied period, you know, like with a MIDI controller. Now I'm back to just a few pedals again. I find for me personally, if there's too much on the floor, it really does interfere. And I'm and I'm talking. It depends on on what the you know. If I was playing an original, like an alt rock gig, and I needed shimmering sounds, that's a whole different thing. I mean, the stuff I'm playing at the moment with band, I've got two bands, and and it's a lot of like kind of like jazz rock, right? So I just need to, some good tones, and I need to be fully in the moment thinking about the chord changes and improvising and for me if there's too much on the floor or even even if i have to you know think too much about oh a volume pedal or something it gets in the way i've found like this is a journey for me yep. with that you know it's like you yep. want these great tones and everything but i've found if i've gone back to doing it now all on the guitars volume like i used to do years ago and yep. I've, i find it so much easier just because I, I think it's because my brain doesn't have to get involved yep yep you know, so a similar thing Absolutely, absolutely. I um, play for a variety of different styles of, of bands, right. and um, my main gig um, is playing in a group called Absolutely Eighties, which is the lead singers from a whole bunch of eighties um, Aussie iconic bands, um, and I need to make it sound just like the record. And I'm going through. Right. I've got a, a run of shows coming up in about a month's time, and I'm pulling my hair out as to what kind of rig I need to pull all this off. But then um, there's a, a metal band that I play with every now and then. They'll, they'll get together and play some shows and then have a hiatus for a couple of years. When I play with yeah. those guys, it's just guitar, cable, Friedman head. And the amount of people that come up and go, oh, my God, your guitar sound, what are you, what are you running? What, what, what's right, on the floor? Right. And I go, nothing, man. Just <laughs> Yeah, straight into that head. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll have to clue the the sound guy up to give me a bit of a, a bump for the solos, yeah. um, and maybe a bit of am ambience. At worst, I might throw a delay pedal on there just to use during the, the solos to cover yeah. my sloppiness. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, there's just options. No, I got clean. I got dirty. I'll have a channel switcher. That's right. Yeah, just to to change between the yeah. two channels, and that that's it. And yeah. Option option paralysis. It's a yeah. it's a thing, you know. Yeah, and I like I like you know like I have a trio and I do some of my vocal stuff and and in a trio format, you know I like I, you know, it was fun using some of the eventide stuff because it's like you know I could add a pad or I could have a nice um, you know Leslie thing you know and in a trio sometimes that's that's really necessary to kind of you know fill fill out the sonic landscape. But yeah, for me, I just feel like my playing gets a lot better when I'm not thinking about pressing too much, you know, yeah. and thinking about different tones and everything like that. And also, I, I, you know, I started playing, you know how we were saying about in the guitar magazines, that dream of GIT. The other dream I had was playing at the Baked Potato, which for anybody listening doesn't know, it's a, a, a club in North Hollywood that's been there since um, 1970. And basically like all of your musical guitar heavyweights and other instruments have played there. It's it's one of those places, right? And so you don't want to go in there and just not be in the moment. You know, if you're going to play there, you got to bring it, you know? So I don't want to go in there and be worrying about tones and all this other stuff, you know? I yep. want to just go in there and yep. play. So yeah, exactly. But, so yeah. Have, having a switching system, you, you said you went down the, the, the route of using an eventide and all that kind of stuff. Yes. For the longest yes. time, my first decent guitar rig was an 88 MP1, um, which, oh, this one right there. Mm. 88 MP1 right. and a quadroverb. Do I still have a quadroverb there? Yeah, yeah, there's quadroverb down here. Um, yeah. 
for the longest time, I used that and um, no no tap dancing. I had to learn how to program the sounds in there that were right, but yeah. I could go from a shimmering clean with a bit of chorus and compression and delay to balls to the wall, metal with no effects, bang, one button, MIDI. Yeah. Um, when that system died on me, that started me down the road of trying out a million different things, trying pedals. There was I didn't have a switching system uh, and just doing the whole tap dance. And, man, that's very distracting. That's yeah. very distracting. So, but, but when I was running that, I was running a MIDI controller and I was using, because my main amp for the last, I don't know, probably six or seven years is a Bogner Shiva. Beautiful. And so I was, I was using that. It's actually over there. It's purple. Uh, oh, nice. <laughs> I, I was, yeah, they, they, I, I know Reinhold and he made it for me in purple, which is very nice. Oh, beautiful. But uh, yeah, so I, uh, I was, I used that as the main, main straight amp. And then I was using the MIDI controller for, to fire off all kinds of like shimmering effects and things. But again, still too much thinking <laughs> for me. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, Got yeah. A- yeah, and you say the, the Bogner Shiva. Um, I did a demo on one of those going back a couple yeah. of years ago um, that I borrowed off a friend, and yeah, that's a great sounding, great sounding head. It's interesting because I went to the, I went down to to the factory and um, and and I I tested um, a Shiva with six L sixes, a Shiva with uh, EL thirty fours, and then a Shiva with KT eighty eight, and they tend to ship with the KT eighty eight. Yep, and surprisingly. The EL thirty fours blew the other two away to, to really? my ears. Yeah, in that room. Yeah. yeah. So I've got the EL thirty four version. Yeah. Nice. Uh, and, nice. And the thing that was funny about it was the clean was so much more shimmery with the thirty fours than the six or sixes, which I would not have expected. I mean, for years and years, my main amp was a Fender Vibralux, and I yeah. I like that shimmery clean. But no, this this was so much warmer. You know, still to this day, that clean sound on that amp. I mean, I drive it a little bit. I push it because I'm like you. I don't want clean, clean. Yeah. I like just right on the edge, you know. Yeah. But, yeah, it's it's interesting. Those, those uh, 34 sound fantastic in that amp. So. Wow, wow. Well, the one I, I had uh, here had the KT88s in it. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, beautiful. And my friend that owns it uh, has since, since switched to Axe FX. He's got an FM3 on the floor. He does a lot of touring. Do you know an artist named Tony Childs? She had a couple of hits in the late eighties, early nineties. You know, her name is sort of slightly familiar, but not yeah. not. Familiar. Um anyway, he plays for her. She lives out here now, yeah. she's an American artist. And yeah. so yeah, using Axe Effects on ears yeah. and, and everything. Yeah. And he said that he, he pulled out the old Shiva not that long ago and had a bit of a play. Yeah. And he's been raving to me, Oh, you need to go Axe Effects, you need to go Axe Effects, yeah. Yeah. But then he said, No, nah, he played a gig and, and pulled out the old Shiva <laughs> and he just went, Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so you're you're using real amps. You're not oh, yeah. modeling no, guy. I'm, yep. all, I'm all the way real amps. Yeah, I, I use the Bogner. Or for smaller gigs, I've got uh, Mesa Boogie Lone Star Classics. I use. I got one with an extension speaker that's tied in. So yeah, no, I I, I have not gone the way of the digital modeler. And and uh, and I have friends that I have, and I guess I'm a dinosaur, but I just love tube amps. <laughs> <laughs> There's something about just being able to turn the knob if you, if your yeah. tone's not right yeah. without yeah. having to go through menus and things. So I mentioned I was an ADA guy, and yeah. around oh, 2000, 2001, I, I did a quick tour playing for a, a group in Australia here called 1927. They had a bit of a, a hit. Actually, you might have heard of them. Uh, my English flatmate had heard their song, That's When I Think of You. Uh, back in the day, uh, late 80s, they, they had a couple of hits. Anyway, yeah. I went to play with them. It's one of those th- things where we went to rehearse and we played one song and the guys said, well, you obviously know that. We've done this a million times. If you know the rest of the stuff that well, do we really need to do this? Yeah. Um, and their only comment was, oh, can you just back the metal off just a touch? And it was like, okay, my main sound, I've got just a bit too much gain. And just the menu diving and everything I had to do mm. on the yeah, spot right, right. to try and yeah. do that. And that's still using tubes, but still digital yeah. control and everything. Sure, if I only yeah. had a knob that just applied to all the presets where I use that okay. channel, I could just give that a quick little tweak. And yeah. that's more what I'm trying to achieve at the moment. But I mean, I, mean, I had the same thing, and I was just for the even type because I, I was using the app on my phone. 
to adjust everything, you know, and at one point I thought, what am I doing? This is crazy. <laughs> like I got the phone out. It's not connecting. You know, it's like the, the delay is too loud. The gig starts in three minutes, you know, and it's like, I can't turn it down any other way than on the phone. Cause that's how I got it set up. You know? Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's a bit ridiculous. It's a bit, yeah, I'll tell you a funny story. Um, when I was at the, um, when I was at the bad robot studios, I was doing a, a recording there for the, for the engineer and he had this track up and it was an eighties rock kind of track. And and what he wanted to do was was record all these big rock chords. And then he wanted to, as they do, you know, the Mutt Lang school, he wanted to take these power chords and record one note at a time, triple them, then do the other note, triple them, then, you know, and, and like that. So anyway, but he had a Kemper there, you know, and, and we've been using it earlier that day to do um, it's like some Andy Summers style, um, big spread voicings with that lovely chorus. And it sounded great. It sounded, and he played it back and he was like, that sounds fantastic. And he's like, right now we just need to do these rock chords and we'll be done for the session. Yep. So he's, he's sitting on there and he's going through the menu on the camper and he's dialing up all this stuff, you know, and, uh, and he, he finds the sound, you know, and it's like, this is a Marshall Plexi, right? This is a sixties Marshall Plexi, uh, preset, right? So we start playing it and he, he goes, let me test it. And, and he goes, just do the power chords first and then we'll then we'll track the other stuff. Starts testing it and he goes, Yeah, it's not quite, it's not quite right. You know. So he goes into the menus and I'm just sitting there taking a cup of coffee and he's in the menus and he's just kind of changing all the, you know, and he's like, Oh, if I EQ this a bit here, and he goes, Oh, a mic placement. Let me let me change them. So this goes on for about 20 minutes, right? Yeah. He's changing all the because like you say, there's so many options, right? We do it over and over again. And I jokingly say, it's a pity you haven't got a Marshall Plexi. And he goes, I have. I have a <laughs> Marshall Plexi in the next room. And, and like there's this massive room behind the control, uh, behind the desk and everything. And he, it's this sliding glass door. And he's got like all these vintage amps in there, right? Fenders and Marshalls. He's got a Vox AC30 in there. And the, and the Marshalls even got a mic on it, right? So oh. he just turns it on. We, we let it warm up, right? Right, comes back, puts the mic line through. And he goes, okay, one take done and it's the perfect sound so i always tell that story because there's a digital modeling world and there's a two map world but you know when we were in a pinch and we needed that actual sound the amp did it yeah so, yeah so that it. that was my experience and this is quite a while ago now with axe effects and this is back around yeah. before the axe effects 2 uh and i i bought one and i was trying to put some guitars down on a friend of mine's record that I was producing and I just couldn't get a good semi broken up tone that would just sit in the mix right. Mm -hmm. It would either be, if I got it to the, where I could hear where it should sit in the mix, I couldn't make out what I was playing. If I turned it up so I could make out what I was playing, it was too loud. It was masking everything else. Yeah. It, it didn't have its own little space where it just sat and popped its head out and I um, ended up ordering an Egnator tweaker head, which I'm looking at right there. It's been blown up for a while. Um, and it was the first that they weren't in Australia yet. I ordered this online and it, and it turned up. I turned it on, put a 57 on it, first take. What mm -hmm. I'd spent weeks trying to achieve from the Axe Effects, I got first go. It was just like that. That's all I wanted. I just wanted to play this rhythm part that filled the whole thing, sat in its own place sonically, didn't cover anything else, and I could just turn the knob and dial in the tone in 10 seconds flat, and that's still my experience. Um, you know, those I've got... Great, those are great amps, by the way. I like them. They are. I've, I keep looking up at it. It's yeah. been... I've yeah. blown the transformer in it. Um, I mean, I think that's, I think that's, that's what I've had. Cause I've, I've used the ax effects on a session as well. And I think they do everything well, except that gain, those gain sounds that sit right in the mid, that's been my experience. I can't quite get them to sit right. Or at least the engineers can't quite get them to sit right in the mix. Yep. There's something about that. I, I wonder what that is. Is it, is it the air moving? Maybe it is, you know, can you not really simulate that? Maybe not. I don't know. But I can, there's something. I, I can pick any any blind test that's out there and yeah. they go, oh, which is the model and which is the real amp? Right. Once you know what to listen for, you can't unlisten for it. And it's everyone's listening to the tone of the amplifier, the, the EQ, and they're right. all going, it's identical. It's identical. They're not listening to the dynamic. Mm -hmm. And it's like a lot of people can't hear compression. And right. there's a lot of... 
big name engineers when I forgot about it being a guitar player for many years and was just working on my production chops, etc. And yeah. I was reading all this stuff with engineers and it was quite common that guys would say, you know, I worked in a studio for two or three years as, as an assistant before I actually heard what compression did. And they'd all go, yeah, I just nod and go, yeah, I can, yeah, yeah. But they said it was one day, it was a light bulb moment. It's like, oh, I hear that. And mm -hmm. I have friends of mine that work in music stores and they all say the most returned pedal is a compressor pedal. They yeah. go, it doesn't do anything. Right, not right, listening right, and that yeah. is what um, what I hear the difference in a modeler versus the real thing yeah. is the dynamic and the way the front of the note pops out and has more of a, a transient mm -hmm. about it, which just doesn't happen on the modeler, yeah. or if it does, it happens in a fake kind of way. Yeah, um, I agree. With, I agree. I know exactly what you mean by that as well. It's funny. It's it, yeah, I, I completely agree, and it's very difficult to describe, but. You know it when you hear it. <laughs> yeah, you know. yeah. Someone's just made the comment, and yet how often do you hear someone saying, my Axe Effects is sitting over there with a blown transformer? Touche. Uh <laughs> <laughs> That's a great point. I mean, some of the some of the gigs I've played, the noises that have come through my amp, I mean, it's like Spinal Tap. I've, yeah. had, I've had airports, I've had German radio. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I take your point. Now, I, I, I must point out, I've had Bruce Egnator on here. Bruce is a lovely chap. Yeah. Um, yeah. His hand-built... Uh, amps that he hand built in the USA, which set his name. Unbelievable. He did what a lot of uh, companies do and went, okay, well, I'll get them built offshore. And the Chinese didn't deliver on the, the transformer specs that he wanted. Right. Um, and unfortunately, those Chinese Ignators have got a very bad name because the transformers all blew up in them. And mine was a victim of that. So I've never had issues with another tube amp. Um, unfortunately, I mine blew up when I lent it to somebody and I think they turned it on without the speaker plugged in yeah. and that would just instantly blow those. Whereas um, the first my Freedmans, like they've they got really industrial strength bloody transformers where you can run those without oh, anything yeah. plugged in and go, oh, oh shit, yeah, and, and it won't blow up instantly like some of the cheaper. Yeah, stuff. no, that's great. That's great. The mm -hmm. first tube amps I ever used in the UK were um, Marshall uh, JTM 45s. And uh, I blew up about seven of them. I oh. just couldn't stop blowing them out. And it turns out there was a design flaw. It didn't have a fan in them. And they would just overheat and just blow. Okay. So that was, that was a real problem <laughs> for a while there. It was like, uh-oh, there's that smell again. My amp's about to go. Uh, you know, um, so, yeah. What a nice so they, amp to uh, to be playing through, though. Yeah, yeah, it was a nice little, nice little amp, but uh, yeah, they used to blow. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, <laughs> so um, Bernie's asking, what guitars yeah. are in the background that you've got there? Oh yeah. Um, so my, I'm, I should, I should start by saying, you know, most of my students have more guitars than I do. I'm not a guitar hoarder at all. I, I have, you know, I have three electric guitars, an acoustic guitar, and a bass. That's it, <laughs> which I know is unheard of, right? Yeah. But uh, no, I've always been someone that's kind of recycled my gear as I go through. And, you know, so my main guitar now, uh, oh, here, I'll grab it. My my main guitar is this beautiful Kiesel D6 custom. Oh, look with at a, that. With a flame, with a flame roasted, uh, I don't know if you can see that, flame roasted maple neck. And uh, it has this beautiful poplar top and it is sort of like um, my daughter actually helped me pick out the um the, you'll, you'll appreciate this we were looking at some colors and everything and she goes that one looks like your coffee and i went That's <laughs> great. Great. i'll take that so yeah i, I got this and uh, it has kiesel's um uh, what are they called beryllium pickups in it which yeah. are more like vintage voice they're not hot fizzy ones you know they're more, more vintage yep uh yeah and, and it's it's very unusual for me to have a guitar with two humbuckers in it i think the last time i had a guitar with two humbuckers in it i was about 18 or 19. i haven't had a humbucker guitar for a long time uh, yeah. I've, I've tended to go with the strat style um single single humbucker that's been yeah. my thing for many years but so uh, yeah i absolutely love this guitar uh i've just had it for a, about a year or so and uh that is beautiful you know, I, had it, I had it hand built which is what they do, you know. Is the I, uh, I, gold hardware tarnishing? You, you just can't have gold hardware and it doesn't start to tarnish. Is that one? It is tarnishing already, yeah. 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 And I'm, I'm like, when I play gigs, I'm like, I'm not, I'm not light on my guitars. Let's put it that way. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it is tarnishing. But you know, it, that's all right. I, I'm, I'm not been too worried about that. And then yeah. this one, and then this one, which was my 
other. This has been a main guitar for a long time. This is an exotic. Uh, and this one, this one is quite funny because I, I got with exotic. I got an endorsement with them pretty early on and got their number. My pink guitar from them is number 17 that they made, which is pretty early in their company, um, which is a lovely guitar. And then this and, and the, the flame roasted necks on again. It's like, like once you get into this flame roasted neck thing, it's really hard to go back. Yeah, you know? yeah. It really is. It's something. It's just the way they feel. You know, yeah. this, this one's a big one. This this is a pretty thick neck for me. Um, you know, it's kind of a sixes style. And this is uh, this is their pickups. But um, the funny thing about this one is, it was a, quite a few years went by before I had the pink one and this one. And then when they made me this one, you know, you don't choose your serial number. It's just how they come off the factory. Yeah. And this one's six six six. So so I call this so I call this the Blue Devil. Nice, yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. but, Rob, yeah, I, I got to say, when I went to Nam a few years ago, um, yeah. and I, I'm totally a Strat guy myself. Um, yeah. The yeah, exotic USA like that. There was a Mary Kay colored one. Um, yeah, that just blew my mind. I just kept coming back to their stand and going, "Oh, this guitar." Um, and I remember talking to the the guy and going, "Is this an asymmetrical neck shape?" And he went. Yes, it is. Yeah. Um, he said, did you feel that? I said, yeah. He goes, you're the first person at the show that's actually picked it up and felt that go. straight away. So is that an asymmetrical neck you've got on that? Uh, <laughs> that's a really good question. Probably haven't noticed until now. I, I, I haven't noticed, to be honest with you. How would, how would I notice that? <laughs> um, ooh, is one side of the neck shallower than the other? Like, so the back of it, so. the, the back of the neck, like... I don't think so. No, pretty, okay. Pretty, yeah, yeah. Because like you, you know the like music that. man, music man uh, Eddie Van Halen yes. style. He, yeah, that's yeah, that's yeah. asymmetrical. No, I don't think I don't, this doesn't really do that. I don't think, but uh, but yeah. No, I think that's pretty even. And what are you stringing I mean, your guitars I, with? I, I probably wouldn't have noticed anyway. You see? Yeah. There you go. What are you stringing your guitars with? So these days, quite interesting. These days, so when I was back, when I was back doing two hundred gigs a year, I used to play Elevens, Diodario Elevens, and 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 I was in regular tuning, which is quite, you know. And then I had a few wrist wrist problems over the years. Yeah. And uh, so these days, I use a nine point five, which is quite low as a set, and I use Kurt Mangans, and uh, and and I must say that you know I was using tens for many years. And I can't remember why. I think it was that I was having such bad wrist issues that I went to a 9.5. And there's really not a big difference. I put nines on and I hated them. And would you believe 9.5 still feel like tens to me? So, I mean, that might seem crazy, but yep. it does make a difference. Yep. Um, so, yeah, I'm using the, the Kurt Mangan's 9.5s. I really like them. I, I had the same issue where I, I started getting tendonitis. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I had one of the <laughs> – I had someone try and pull the – um, well, you'll never work in this town again on me. So I said, started saying yes to everybody, uh, yeah. just to, it's like, okay, you can get nasty about it. I'm just going to work my ass off and, uh, you right. watch me keep working in this town. Anyway, right. I overdid <laughs> it and gave myself tendonitis in the hands and, um, had to do a bit of the experimenting. I was using tens at the time, uh, went down to nines. I tried the 9.5s. Um, mm. I tried eights. Somebody gave me eight. Wow, yeah. 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 In fact, Bernie that's in the chat room there that just asked about yeah. strings uh, gave me a set yeah. of eights. And I thought they were going to sound terrible. No. No. I was, you know big... what? Whenever anyone says anything about eights, I say Albert Lee, Billy Gibbons. I mean, there's tone in those for days. If you if you have a light touch, you know. Man, back in the 70s, I think Tony Iommi was using eights, tuned down a whole step. Right, right. And yeah, yeah, I, and because of, because of his fingertips, he was going real light, right? Well, I think Brian May was using eights back then as well. Yeah, it was just yeah. the dumb thing back in the in the seventies, yeah. and yeah. man, that, those guys' tones were fantastic. And I I just found that a it took away the the issues I was having, um, yeah, good, just being able yeah. to to bend, and uh, but I didn't notice a big loss in tone like everybody would no. tell you. 
I mean, I don't. I, I think the nine point fives are fine as, as well. You know, but that's a horrible feeling. Like, I'm glad you were able to do that because, you know, I know from my own experience, there's no worse feeling than you pick up the guitar to play and you just because it fills you with joy and it just hurts and it's just like it's a horrible feeling and it? it really is. So, Absolutely. yeah, I mean, I have no. I d- doesn't matter to me. I use I use sixes if I have yeah. to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but uh, yeah, but no, you're absolutely right though. I mean, I think that's one of those things. It's another one of those kind of like internet things like you got to use 11 or 12 gauge or you know otherwise your tone's not as good as stevie ray vaughan you know it's not nonsense it's not man nonsense. the stuff that's that's on the internet like you know, know. and there's flavors of the month you know um yeah. true bypass all your pedals have to be true bypass that's yes. true bypass. and then exactly. and now it's no no you need buffers and everything everything you need this you, this switch needs to have a but how about i just use the pedals that aren't true bypass which have a freaking buffer built in oh, right. Right, right that was that was bad couple of years ago yeah. now you're saying that's good and um, so i don't i don't bother with any of it i don't go down the rabbit hole at all again i have students that do and i and i say to them look i say if you if you if part of playing the guitar for you is you know the community aspect of forums and arguing back and forth about true bypass or whatever then that's brilliant but if you're coming to me and you're actually saying i really want to progress to the next level then you know this is what it's going to take i I just put that out there to people and there's nothing wrong with being on those forums and doing all that it's fun but it's like if you're doing that more than you're playing guitar and you're wondering why your guitar playing isn't improving there you go yeah yeah now rob you said uh you had uh lower output pickups in your guitars there yeah yeah Yeah, that's something i I stumbled on in the the exotic as well yep that's something i stumbled on 10 years ago or more um my main Gigging guitar is uh, something I threw together out of Fender parts, and I've had every pickup and neck and everything on it and to arrive at what I've got now. Um, yeah. But I started out with a Duncan Invader pickup in it, which is the highest output uh, wow, passive yeah. pickup uh, available. And yeah. um, I am now, um, yeah, I've got like a P90 voiced single coil in it, which I absolutely yeah. love. And it's something that I've, I've had to learn the hard way that high output pickups aren't where it's at. Lower, you actually, I, I, I use the term hear the wood of the guitar more. Oh, I don't I think you're actually that. hearing the wood, but you are hearing no, more. Yeah, you're, yeah. He- you're hearing what you think the wood would sound like, exactly. right? So, yeah. Exactly, yeah. And I noticed that you know, going from a humbucker, a fitted guitar to a single coil humbuckers are pushing more of the amp it's more like i'm hearing the amp more than the guitar yeah. um yeah. so yeah I, and i'm starting to notice that a lot of people are gravitating towards but one thing I, i'm real picky about and i went back and forth with exotic about and also kiesel is there not being a jump between the the single and the humbucker and there really yeah. isn't that's guitars. hard they're that's very, hard they're very well but ba- it's very hard they're yeah. very well balanced it's almost like rolling some tone off you know right for the next so yeah. very well balanced and yeah and you know i became another another crazy surreal thing about living in la and, and doing gigs at these places and, and teaching at mi as you, you you start to become friends with some of these people that you grew up just you know like scott henderson's a good example who i know you had on your show right yeah. i love scott and uh you know he and i are friends and and he told me that um you know the tone is in the is in the low output pickups and he also told me about watch out for your cable length and it's amazing what a difference guitar cable to the first pedal is and also speaker cable and i found out this the hard way. i was in a studio here called revolver studios and i was tracking some stuff and i had the bogner and it was cranked and i had the head in the control room with me and the cab was in another room and the and the engineer ran this ridiculously long speaker cable and it just sounded awful it sounded so thin and crap and he's like i don't know what i don't know what's going on and i said well, what about the speaker cable you know and he was like i don't think it's going to make any difference and i said can we just try it you know and and we we moved the head in put a tiny you know short speaker cable, made all the difference in the world like yeah. and, and so it's like it's so funny we get so into our pedals and so into our tubes and the amps and all this kind of stuff but your cable and it doesn't have to be like super high quality cable but the length of the cable is really important yeah, you know, I just watched really. a a bit of a comparison video between different cables. Um, yeah. So they had a switching system with just a loop of thirty foot of cable in each yeah. in each uh, loop, and um, we're switching between them. And oh my god, what a difference! I didn't realize. And then the guy showed off um, his buffer, and 
it's amazing the buffer totally negates any of that. It, mm. Yeah. Yeah. All the cables became ev- um, equal, basically. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, with yeah. a good buffer in front of it. So yeah. that's one thing um, that I'm really conscious of now that I'm trying to piece together a, a rig for these upcoming shows is get my buffering right, right cable, etc. I think another thing I've noticed while we're talking about pickups and tone is is that for many well i mean i started doing it pretty early because i I was never a big volume pedal guy even though like the a the la thing is volume pedals you know like all the la guys use volume, but i've never really enjoyed them that much but um what i because i was always a strap player and i used to just use singles you know it's only probably in the last when i got into with the exotics i started going to a humbucker in the bridge but and even that's very low output but um one thing i've always done is run the treble on the amp and the mids up and then i always turn the tone control on the guitar down and i always use the volume on the guitar never above nine ever wow i'll never turn the guitar all the way up ever at a gig you know and it's like and my rhythm's often on five or six yeah you know yeah. and so I, I that's just how i've always played always got used to doing it that way yeah. and it really works for me and, I, and it's like because if i want if i if i go up to nine and i'm not getting quite enough high end cut through i just bring the tone up a little bit Yep. You know, and it's one of these things, as you know, when you play so much, all that's happening without you thinking about yeah. it. You know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, although maybe I am thinking about it, which is why I don't want to deal with stuff on the floor as well. <laughs> you know, yeah. that's enough to deal with. But yeah. I mean, it's great because it becomes almost an extension of your playing. It's, just what you it's amazing. I, I I can tailor um, the distortion from my my volume knob, and right. it's a subconscious right. thing. You'll just yeah. you'll, you'll yeah. be. A, big chord ringing out and you'll just know yeah. that's not that's too much sustain just back it off a touch and right. yep right. that's perfect right. um yeah yeah, yeah. so in real time which is cool too I, yeah. I guess that means you have treble bleed circuits in your guitar as well then uh no i don't actually but it doesn't seem to it doesn't seem to make much of a difference okay you know? this is something i just discovered i yeah. have a beautiful friedman vintage s guitar sitting over mm. there I, I said when i went to nam and i played the the exotic there was two standout guitars for me uh yeah. the exotic and the, the friedman and um the exotic was just too nice i felt like i'd i you know wouldn't want to touch it or just keep it behind a glass cabinet whereas the friedman oh, really? felt like a like an old friend um but so when i went out to gig when i play small gigs man there's a big issue here uh in my town with noise restrictions etc so if i'm not allowed to take a real amp well you know i'm going to play through an ipad and no one's going to tell the difference between my ipad and a four thousand right. dollar axe effects or right, um right. but one thing i noticed with the friedman was as i went to roll down playing through a, a, a modeler there was no treble bleed circuit on it and i'd do my usual thing and my sound would just turn to absolute shit and i was like What's going on? Has my treble bleed circuit come off on this thing? And that, and I opened it up. And I was like, "There is no treble bleed. That's weird." I thought they would have included one. Now that I've got a Friedman head again, and you wind back, it doesn't lose the treble. So this is oh, something it was I've, in the model that was doing it. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, with the bug, no, I don't. I don't notice a big loss yeah, when I yep. do that. You know, so that's yeah. something I've only just worked out in recent uh-huh. weeks. Is that not having a treble bleed really affects? If you're using a modeler versus using a nice high end amplifier, it doesn't matter. Yeah. You wind it back and, and it's not needed. If I if if in ten years I say I've had a midlife crisis, I've sold my Bogner and I've gone fully modeling, remind me of that. Won't you? Yeah, yeah, that's that's what it'll be. And you know what, my friend uh, that I said uh, plays the Axe Effects now, touring with Tony Childs. Yeah. yeah, he said his Sir guitar is like that, that it doesn't have a treble bleed, and when he uses the modeler. He can't do the wind down thing without losing uh, all, yeah. his, all his treble. Yeah. Now, Rob, you also said that you have quite a chunky neck on your guitar, and that's well, I something on, I, do on the, I do on the exotic. Yep. The keys are less slimmer. The keys are more like a standard C. The exotics, it feels like the old Jeff Beck strat. It's a big, it's like a sixties neck. Right? I love that. I yeah. love I that. I love it too. But I must say that because I was having some wrist stuff and everything. It's quite nice to have a slimmer one as well. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, yeah. Uh, I like it too. Though. And there's something about when you hold a chord, the way it feels with that big chunky neck as well. And obviously the sound as well, you know, but yeah. I think that's a very overlooked part of the tone is uh, the size of the neck. And yeah. the strat that I said I pieced together, I've had a million necks and pickups in it. Yeah. Uh, I originally borrowed a, a warmoth neck that was a big, 
boat neck shape. So it was like a huge V. And at first, it was so foreign to me. It was like, why would anybody play this? After about right. 10 minutes of noodling it, I went, oh, this this fits my hand very nicely. I'm I'm, I'm six foot three, so I've, I've got quite large hands. I'm, and I'm that- six two. I'm six two, and I've got pretty big hands too. And I find the same thing. But it, now, because I've got so used to the keysel, like I'm not. Re- I don't like to swap around a lot. Like I'll play one guitar for six, eight months, and then maybe I'll go to the other one. You know, I'm really yeah. like, uh, and and so when I go to the exotic, it takes me a couple of hours now to really feel like okay, now I'm you. You know, it's like it shifts or something. You know, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. It's, but but yeah. yeah, but I know what you mean though. Like I like the way the big neck feels, but I'm just trying to minimize. You know. Yeah, of, yeah. So. Uh, so that was a real eye opener, just how much um, tone comes from the neck for me. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, it, it really does. The the, ni- the the best sounding guitar I've ever had, apart from those two, were and the pink one's really nice. But um, years and years ago, when I was doing a lot of blues gigs, I had a, a custom shop sixty reissue or sixty two reissue, which are Fiesta Red, and I put Lindy Fraylin blues specials i think they're called right in it which is just singles and the neck on that thing was like a baseball bat and it just it sounded great that's the other the other guitar i had that's the only one i wish i probably should have kept the through all the years of you know uh, and the funny thing about that guitar is i played so many gigs with it people used to come up to me and say uh, oh i don't know how i feel about those relics and i used to say it's not a relic i've just played it for 10 years yeah <laughs> yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. absolutely but that one but that one is interesting you say that because that one was in my mind the other one that really had that tone and that's the only other one i've ever had that's had a giant neck yeah you know? yeah so, yeah yeah okay so we were talking about your, your signal path there um yeah. you start those, those lovely guitars that you just showed us what yeah. do they plug into what's next in line for you Oh well, I've got a um, I've got a, a was a craft tuner, you know the the boss was a craft modded tuner, which is a buffer basically, right? Yep. Acts as a buffer, and then and then again, I'm like really minimalist here with the pedals. I've got a Greer Light Speed that's a, that's I'm using as a clean boost, and I leave it on all the time to drive the amp. So if I'm playing, we play some clubs here like Vitello's or or the Mint, which are smaller clubs, but I want the amp to be cooking a little bit, so that kind of does that. For me you know pushes the clean side of the amp so i leave that on all the time i've got a strymon lex for um uh, leslie effects uh, which i love and and then um and then the only other pedal i'm using is the red snapper which is the if i if i want extra gain yeah. i use that yeah. and then through the through the effects loop of the oh and actually there's one other one a friend of mine uh bought me this thing called the freak out which is this have you seen that with me? yeah yeah yeah, yeah. What? fun pedal that is isn't it yeah it's, yeah it's, so that's essentially respect. makes your guitar feedback yeah it's like a feedback yeah, yeah. Guitar, which, which i like to do at jazz gigs just to scare people but you know <laughs> like so, so you know you, you hit any chord clean or dirty put it on and and it goes to feedback almost immediately you set the time actually when it goes to feedback and you can also set harmonics so you can have feedback up a fifth or whatever which is awesome uh, yeah, i wonder so. how that works without driving the actual string because i've got a, a hamer here with a sustainiac built in and that actually yeah. drives a string but those right. freak outs I, I don't know how that works because it's it's the on only the floor. thing that is the only thing i wish it did do that it doesn't do is if you start to manipulate the feedback like with the whammy bar it goes away oh. so yeah so you can't really get too like hendrix down on it which is a shame because i want to you know but, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. and, then, yeah. and then through the through the effects loop of the amp i run a strymon timeline nice um, and i use that for swells and I use and I use, have a couple of delays on that, and that's it. That's yeah. My, that's the yeah. Thing. So, so yeah. Rob, I, I have a bit of a, an ADD brain, and I looked over uh, at the comments section as you said what that first pedal was what, that you said was always on. What was? Oh, the the Greer the Greer Light Speed. What's that all about? G R E E R. It's yeah. a it's a um, f- friend of mine that does um, friend of mine that does uh, gospel gigs uh, introduced it to me, and uh, he's like doesn't matter what amp I bring out, this pedal adds that little sparkle. And he's absolutely right. He really is. It's so I, and I've used this pedal with Fender amps and, you know, and, and like backline stuff that's not mine. And then I use it with my gear and it really does a nice little little trick. But I set it, I set the drive on it low. So I'm not really using, I don't think I'm using the pedal for what it's, I think it's supposed to be an overdrive pedal, but yeah. I use it as a, 
you know, just a, like a booster to push push the amp a little bit. And it sounds great, you know. So I use, I leave that on all the time. And sometimes I'll go, is this really doing anything? And I'll turn it off at sound check, and I go, yeah, it really. Yeah, is. yeah, it does. Like, yeah. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. If, you want, I mean, if you want, if you want pristine clean, you don't need it. But like, I'm like you, I like a little bit. And I was talking with Scott about this, but I like a little bit of, you know, a little bit of push and break up. Yeah, uh, so I the, much prefer so. that to compression. Yeah, you know, just having Me that little too. bit of yeah, Me too. Yeah. yeah. If I put a compressor on there, I'm the hearing it. The, place, like, like the only time I used the compression pedal was when I did that that uh, show band with all all the funk because it was actually pretty useful then, you know. But yeah. Uh, yeah, no, you don't you don't really you know I prefer that too. Yeah, you know, I'd, I'd like though, even though a lot of the gigs I do come under like they have the word jazz in them. They're much more like jazz, funk, jazz, rock. They're not traditional at all. I have no interest in playing traditional jazz because there's a million people that could do it better than I do. I don't want to do that. It's not, it doesn't interest me. So I'm always going to have a distorted lead tone no matter what. I like yeah. it. You know, yeah, so. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I, I much prefer to have the amp uh, go into a little bit of saturation rather yeah. than compression. Um, yeah. And that's just the issue I, I'm having with the, the little Friedman Double J Jr. is the clean channel is too clean. Yeah, and I'm looking for something have you to. Tried, you know, have you thought about like one of those exotic boosters? Those are pretty good for that. You know, I've got a Line Six Helix and HX Effects here, and mm -hmm. there's a model of that, and that mm -hmm. that absolutely brings the goods to the channel, mm -hmm. and it's made me think. Well, I really I need to try out the real thing because yeah, if I if, didn't have if I wasn't using the Greer, that's what I would use because yeah. I like them. Yeah. But I really, but you know, if you if you if you get a chance to try out the Greer, maybe give it a go because it's a nice. Pedal. I've I, I wrote that down there. Um, yeah. Greer Lightspeed. I'm going to take a trip yeah. to uh, some pedal specialists and and take my little head there and see if that yeah. helps with the, the clean channel side of things. What are you yeah, using for picks? What are you using for picks, Rob? So for picks, I I oh I went. It's ever so funny. So for the longest time, you know, I was like, no, nah, whatever, pick doesn't matter. You know, like you, you like. Van Halen's using those Fender, what are they like, mediums or thins, and his tone is so good, the pick doesn't matter, and all this. And then I changed my mind. <laughs> and then I, I, I went on this like quest for the Holy Grail pick for about a year. And I ordered, I think I ordered like every pick known to man. I mean, yep. it was it was ridiculous. Like there were picks arriving just constantly. And and for a number of years, I was using chicken picks, which I really like still to this day. Uh, yeah, yeah, and 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 uh, I'm friends with the owner, and he's great, Epo, and he's an awesome guy, and everything like that. But I must say, I have discovered another pick that's sort of become my favorite, even though I do use the chicken pick for recording still because I like the way it tracks. Um, I'm using a blue chip, a blue chip eighty, which is a two millimeter pick. Uh, let me let me grab one. And uh, blue chip, I haven't heard of those. Yeah, it's a uh, it's actually something that a lot of mandolin players use. It doesn't look. I don't know the C really is that. Oh yeah, <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a you know it's it's a jazz three size mm -hmm. to jazz three. Um, I don't know what it's made of, but there's something about this material. And here, here's the thing. Here's the thing about this pick. This pick costs fifty dollars. Whoa! Right, and so I thought it's probably you know like the emperor's new clothes, right? Yeah. I thought this is gonna this has got to be nonsense, isn't it? You know. So what I, <laughs> what I did was I I got one of them. And I played it and I played a one note and I went, oh, I like that. Oh, no. You know, <laughs> I, didn't want to, I didn't want to like it because it's like, how many picks did you drop through the course of a day, right? You know, I'm like, I don't want to like that, you know. So then I went on a quest to find every pick that was, you know, like $5 and less that would be as good as this one. Because I don't believe in, you know, things like it's, if it costs more, it must be better. I don't I don't subscribe yeah. to that. Right? I've, had, I've had some mexican strats that have been as good as anything right yeah. you know over the years yeah. but um but uh no i mean this pick is i just love it the one that i tried the one um what's the one uh i tried the the guthrie one i forget what it's called i forget what the company is called um and that was close but this is better <laughs> for yeah. me personally. yeah yeah there's something about and it, it it's a tonal thing and it's a it's a touch thing you know uh, I also have, I'm, I'm a real, like when I play gigs, you know, I, I sweat like a wild buffalo. It's terrible, right? So I have to have a grip on my pick. And so I, I, I drilled holes in this one as a grip because I don't have grips. The chicken picks have a lovely surface feel to them, don't it they? It does. It does. You know, there's, yeah. something about that, there's something about that material, the chicken pick, that I really like as well. So those would be the two that I go back and forth on, my chicken yep. pick 
and 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 this and this is a two millimeter blue chip eighty, and I, I I love it. I think it's fantastic. Now we now I, I am going to give a bit of a shout out to Chicken Picks because they do sponsor yeah. the show. Oh, they're fantastic. They're fantastic. Um, and they come in a multitude of uh, styles. I've got okay. Yeah, I've got to try and cover, get my eyes out of the shot. So I, use that, the, I use the the badass ones, the badass. Uh, that's the uh, little the jazz minute. one, right? Yeah, the two minute. Well, actually, it's interesting because because a lot a lot of people um, have trouble going from a regular size pick to a jazz three. And you know, like there's the Eric Johnson teardrops, there's the John Petrucci, there's all those jazz threes, but that is actually bigger than a jazz three. So that's yeah, a, right. it's not as big as a regular pick. That's go. my pick there. I, I use the Bermuda, the rounded triangle. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely bigger. But but the badass, the badass one is a bit bigger than a Jazz Three. So it's quite a good. If you've always thought I want to try a Jazz Three, but they feel too small, that's a good one to sort of like you know as your entry level Jazz Three because that's the one you're talking bigger. about right there. Yeah, that one. Yeah. 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 What's yep. that? A two point five? I think there's a there's a. It is a 2.5. Yep. Yep. Yeah, there's a 2 and a 2.5 and a 3.2. 3.2 really is quite heavy, but uh yeah, I I like the the 2 and the 2.5 in those and that's the one I would I use off and on with this one. So, yeah. So, I'm just going to point out to folks that um Epo has sent me uh, a bunch for giveaways. Um and I haven't done them yet because I needed to get the subscriber count up. So, if you are watching um like, subscribe, all that kind of stuff. I have a Facebook uh, user group called Chats with Guitar Cats. I'm going to run the competitions through that. So add yourself to the group. And as I my numbers, I was, I was setting myself to 5,000. Once I get to 5,000 subs, uh, I'm going to start giving away these chicken picks. I also have stuff from Summer Cable and some awesome cleaning packs from ET Guitars, which I'm going to do a restore of a 73 SG that's sitting over there that's been rotting under my friend's bed. And I'm going to use nice. some... ET uh, guitars, cleaning products to get that up to scratch. But yeah, picks, man, I didn't realize um, how addicted you can get to one pick. Now, I, I've got a funny thing about the the chicken picks. I went to um, YouTuber Henning Pauli's place. Uh, he's German um, YouTuber. He has an event called 42 Gear Street that he hosts each year, and I, I went to that. And... There I am with, you know, maybe 15 or so of world's top guitar YouTubers. Do you think I thought to bring a pick? No, I thought there'd be picks everywhere. But we got, <laughs> got given these sample packs of these chicken picks, and they were yeah. so different to anything I'd ever used before. And I remember having to hassle someone going, man, you, you got any normal picks? I can't use this bloody thing. Now that I've gotten used to them, I just yeah. – they are it's just a way – I mean, they're thick. Man, this thing is – yeah, it's a 2.1, but they're so thick. They yeah. don't wear out. I can do pick scrapes and they don't they get don't, big and, chunks. And there's something about that material with those where they don't really feel that thick. Even though mm. it is thick, it doesn't feel thick. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I've, tried, I've, I've tried really thick picks before where I'll get stuck on the strings. And with that, it's never happened. You know? mm. So, mm. yeah, it's so now Epo's done a good thing with those. Um, and yeah. yeah, and it's surprising quite expensive like i do have a tendency of leaving them behind on my mic stand at gigs and i go yeah. oh okay that was a lot of money i just left behind there believe um, me when you if you're using a piece as expensive as this you have a little you have a little pack on your keys and you put it in there every single time you put your guitar down that's what i do funnily yeah. enough yeah. <laughs> epo did send uh, in there my giveaway pack some pick pouches yeah for key rings. So, um, like I say, folks, if you like, subscribe and join the Facebook group, I will be giving these away very shortly. That's very cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, I am just going to point out if anybody's watching and wants to ask Rob any questions, um, now's a good time to throw in some questions. Somebody commented that they heard the laundry alarm go off, and that was that was why. And I, I said to my flatmate, mate, hey, oh, this is a really tight pickup pack. Pattern. You can do what you want. No one's going to hear anything. So I'm surprised somebody heard the. Oh, that's good hearing. That's a musician's ears, right? It there. was. Well, yeah. some musicians' ears tends to be deaf as you approach our age. <laughs> that's, uh, true. that's true. Especially us guys not using modelers. Exactly. So that's yeah. A good point. yeah. Uh, you know, and that's something I, I tend to ask people a lot. Have, how's your hearing? Has the the gigs over no, the years it's, affected it's, your yeah, hearing? Yeah, it's, it's all right. I I had a little bit of ringing for. a <laughs> for a few years but i uh 
I started using earplugs, and uh, since I started doing that, you know, it's amazing. Some guys, some of the like, some of the old school guys will not use earplugs, which is flipping amazing to me after you know after all the years doing so i must say now i'm i'm you know i'll go to any gig and i, I always carry it but like if i'm in Same. the audience or i'm playing i, I carry it but the only one of the bands i play with catatonic is not a we actually have the quietest drummer i think i've ever played with in my entire life uh well one of the other bands i play with in la was a prog band and i i wrote an album with them we did a bunch of gigs and that drummer even with earplugs in i was ringing like i mean he was just insanely loud it was it was painful but anyway he was a great drummer but still just a tad loud but uh yeah i just take earplugs with me everywhere now and it's all right it's not a problem you know i i it, it there's you know when i go to bed at night it's not ringing anymore so i think i got away with it you know but there were a few years there where it was a little bit you know i was hearing some white noise i uh i don't like talking about tinnitus because yeah. you start I start to think about it, and then all of a right, sudden, right. it just ah, yeah, like, oh, that is so loud. Yeah. Um, and mine have rung like a bastard since a, a teenager, to be honest with you. Uh, yeah. And it's when I was playing in bands that would rehearse four nights a week, original bands trying to write, yeah. and you're in a tiny little shed. The drummer symbol is right there, and this yeah. year is the one that that rings, and I know it's from those years of having that, that symbol. symbol is, that's probably the, I would say that's probably the most common that symbol. However. I had, again, another like like crazy story about moving to LA. Um, I, I got to have lunch with Steve Lukather, who's one of my idols growing up, you know, at, at a studio and we're talking about stuff. And he told me that the ringing in his ear didn't come from all of the amps and all that over the years. It came from an inexperienced singer putting his headphones on the microphone in a studio session and it fed back in the rest of their cans. And he said, ever since that day, He's had that ringing, not the amps, you know, but it was the inexperienced pop singer that just like caused a feedback loop in the studio and blew his ears. So, oh. yeah, isn't that crazy? Yeah. Brutal. It is. It is. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mine got considerably worse. I did a cruise ship gig. Yeah. Uh, it was a last minute. Somebody needed somebody to fill in. And there was a lady singing. We had a, a, a full band, but she had her wedges so loud and had such a piercing voice and because i didn't know the material that well i couldn't wear plugs because yeah. i tell people i don't remember how songs go i hear how they go so i need yeah. to hear what i'm playing and if i'm a, a, a semitone out i'll hear it instantly when i hear it and right, i'll slide right. into the right so i couldn't wear plugs because i was still feeling out the set and i had times where i walked off the stage just going are you serious, oh, woman? Brutal. That you're yeah. hurting people, and that was a big step backwards in my tinnitus. <laughs> That's amazing that she wasn't hearing that as piercing, though. Maybe it should already blown her ears out at that point. You know, <sighs> she was a bit of a diva. Yeah, uh, you know what? I was going to say that as well. That was my <laughs> that was my next comment. She's probably yeah. a bit of a diva. Yeah, I, I always what I'll do is in situations where I really need to hear like that, I'll I'll put plugs in, but I don't put them in very far like that just to try and get rid of a little bit of that top you know yeah but yeah. I, I know what you mean sometimes sometimes as well the plugs can make you feel disconnected so it's a balance isn't it yeah you know? yeah yeah and times like that bit of tissue paper toilet paper if i forget my yeah. plugs that does wonders yeah. just because it's usually the symbols if the drum is yeah, smashing yeah, yeah. the crap out of those it's, it's going to do it yeah, to them those are brutal they really are yeah yeah, yeah. That's, that's the thing like when you go to a small rehearsal room you're used to playing bigger places. You go to a small rehearsal room, suddenly the drummer's like right there, you know, and it's like, oh, you know. Yeah, yeah it, absolutely. It, it, it can yeah. take its toll for sure. Yeah. Hey, Rob, we talked about um, you working at, at the Musicians Institute, but yeah. you, you also teach, um, you're on True Fire. Now, you said you were yeah. doing that before you yeah, I think I think probably Truefile was one of the first ones to do to do the online stuff and 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 sort of seg like the, when I started with them the courses were CD ROM <laughs> and then it started to move away from that and now they're you know downloads exclusively but it's quite interesting because again um, you know I, I I have such fond memories and I'm sure you do too of the you know like the Starlix. And uh, the hot licks, all those those eighties yeah. video tapes. You know, I love those. And so, you know, and then that sort of all went away a little bit. And True Fire kind of brought it back. Um, I did a book in two thousand and seven, and that got me hooked up with 
guitar player magazine and then that, that got me into true fight it was kind of you know I, kind of a, a pathway but i started working them with them uh you know around 2009 maybe something like that and and um yeah so we started doing i i started running an online classroom for them which now is super common you know like, like everyone's got their own guitar school right you know paul gilbert and all these guys have their own but back then there was not many people doing it and so what the idea was instead of doing live lessons you would have students all over the world that would that you'd film an assignment for you know like i could film somebody with a massive time difference like you for example right yeah. and then and then you know you could do your reply video send it back and we build it up and so i did that with them for you know i still do it for them but we did it for many many years and, and then that led me to going to this they're based out of tampa florida so i go there and i film full i write the courses and go there and shoot full length courses for them i've done nine of those now with them and then uh, and then the, and then jam play and true fire have merged basically true fire acquired jam play oh, cool. but they're still they're still keeping their separate subscriber base and interestingly enough even though they have you know like half a million subscribers each the two don't really cross over it's yeah right interesting for okay. some reason I guess because they have different interfaces different ways of presenting material yeah. true fire have got more into doing um like shorter content more snappy more like we're going to do a course whereas jam play it's more like if if you know if you were going to spend a few hours with me where would our where would the teaching go it allows for some of those you know it's not so scripted it allows for those moments where you say oh that reminds me of this and i go okay well let me show you know so there's a little bit of that to okay to it. it's yeah more like a, a longer experience with them so i've done a couple with them uh, they're based out of colorado so i fly to colorado and uh, they, i mean these shoots are intense as well because we do like you know with true fire we, we do we do two courses a live lesson a, a facebook live and a photo shoot in two days wow <laughs> so, wow that's a, that's a lot of shooting yeah and so you got you got to go in there prepared because you can't go in there and be like uh what was i going to do you know, so, so when you're uh, doing videos for someone like like true yeah, yeah. now um I, I must admit i've never checked out jam play so i'm not familiar with it uh yeah, if anybody I'm really, I'm really excited about them actually because they've got They've got um, who, who just put out a course? Um, the guy from Snarky Puppy just did a big course with it. Oh, cool! Uh, you know, yeah, I forget what his name is, but um, yeah, that guy. They, they've got they've got a whole bunch of people, and and they're kind of opening up a little bit. And a couple of the other MI guys have gone down there as well. Like Jeff Marshall, good, great player, is on there as well. Um, and actually, next year, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say this, but next year I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, next year, they've just asked me to do this uh, really, really intensive jazz fusion course. We're looking at maybe like an eight hour course <laughs> so i'm really excited about that and a, you know i've got a lot of preparation to do before then but uh yeah so okay so you, you, can, you part different, different kind of outlook sorry different kind of they have a different look to them like they have different camera angles uh that true fire do and the whole the whole player and system is different so even though they're sort of in the same umbrella company it's two different approaches nice nice uh you kind of partly answered my question that i was going to ask yeah. in um i was going to ask whether somebody like a true fire or jam play come to you and say hey we'd like uh some videos about blah 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 or do you come to them with i've got an idea for this course i would like to do blah 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 it's both it's, it's both, both actually yeah yeah so, so for true fire i start off and i you know and, and they said what do you want to do and so i wrote out these all these cage courses and ideas but then they would say well while you're here if we shoot this cage course they have they have um they have course templates like they'll say 30 licks in this style or they'll say like one i one i've done a few of with them are take five courses and so an example of a take five course is um you know how to improvise with modes for example right what are modes how do you improvise with them here are five different example jam tracks lessons so that's where the five comes from you know so like that you break it up whatever the topic is you break it into five main points and that's a shorter course you know now with jam play same thing they asked me about the jazz fusion because i really i really love that style of music even though i play lots of different styles you know and and then at the same time they wanted me to come back with two other courses so we can shoot three <laughs> when i go down there so yeah so it's a little bit of both you know and you also cool. got to look at who else they've got on their roster. I mean, like, you know, True Fire have got Steve Vai. They just released their Joe Bonamassa. They've got, they got some heavy hitters, right? So you're not going to go down there and go, 
in the style of Steve Vai if they've got Steve Vai. You know? Man, <laughs> I, I, I got to say, um, when it came to uh, True Fire a few years ago, probably about five years ago now, yeah. um, I stumbled on the, that one day they're having a big sale where you could get the yeah. year subscription for ridiculously yeah, sure. good price. So I jumped on that. Yeah. And uh, a friend of mine um, was over and we watched the whole five hours of Steve Vai. Yeah. And um, she doesn't play guitar. She's not a musician. But at the end of it, she turned to me and said, I just got schooled on life by Steve Vai. Yeah. Because okay, so his, kind of, his really thing is not about, oh, right. this is how so, I play this. It so was more course, the philosophy. It's completely a philosophy course. And that course – was controversial. I'll tell you why. And I had this conversation with the CEO of Truefire, so, so I know it was controversial. A lot of people were a bit disappointed that he didn't go, here's how you play for the love of God, right? I think, I watched that course too. I thought that course was brilliant, right? Oh. And to me, it was more like a TED talk. You know, yeah. it's more like, it's, it is exactly what your friend said. And it's more like, you know, how do you become creative? How do you have a career in this field? How do you, I thought it was great, you know, and it's like, to be honest, you could go online and there's there's probably like 200,000 people telling you how to play for the love of God, right? But and he actually you know, says, he if says you came here, good. if you yeah. came here uh, wanting me to show you how to play scales and blah, 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 there's a thousand guys that can do that better than I can. Right. Yeah, he says that right, right at the start. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah, no, I agree. And I actually, I actually like it. That another great one, is the Pat Martino one. And he is out there, man. I mean, he is out there, but it's a fascinating course. You know, I don't know if you're necessarily going to come away from it and play anything differently, but in terms of just like philosophy and the way you think about the, the life and music, I, I actually really enjoy those courses where it goes yep. off the rails a bit like that. Yep. You know? I think um, I did I got, check I got, out a little bit of that. Now, I'll yeah. tell you what, one thing that I learned from a True Fire video, which yeah. has been invaluable to me as a player um, and I, I, I kind of touched on it before when I mentioned motifs but is it Larry Carlton that has the blues motifs video? 335 motifs yeah 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 yeah. I watched that and then I did a gig with a friend of mine who I've been playing in bands with since I was 14 years old and I did a fill-in gig with him and as soon as I played a line and then played a variation on that, just motifs, and started building up on that. Yeah. He's a bass player. And he quite literally stopped playing, threw his hands in the air, and just <laughs> yelled at me, oh, what the fuck was that? And I just looked at him and went, man, you've heard every trick I have. Right, right, And right. to get that reaction out of you, yeah. wow, okay. And I, like I said, I've just seen this video, and that's been something that I've consciously – Incorporated into I mean, my the, playing. The number, the number one complaint I I see is is when when students that start playing in bands, they're the, the one thing I hear over and over again is I didn't leave enough space. I got nervous. I didn't leave enough space. I mean, it's so important to leave because it's if you go down and bound and you leave the space, you yourself hear yourself go dum down or down and you go oh i'm gonna answer that now but if you go dum down i'm down 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 that's gone <laughs> you know it's, it seems so simple and yet and larry carlton is a flipping master of it you know so you know how i said to you right at the beginning of our conversation how i would get into somebody and then i'd go backwards yep. you know and realize who influenced them great example of that when I first started listening to Toto in the late 80s and was enamored by Steve Lukather, I would read that Lukather was really into Larry Carlton. So I picked up Larry Carlton's first three solo albums on vinyl then. And I was like, oh my God, this is incredible. And that's, the, you know, and that's from a very early age, that sort of stayed with me that, that, the, the way he phrases his note choice and the space, you know, and he'd tell you he got the space from, from BB King, you know, but I mean, but there's something, there's something, sophisticated and simple at the same time about Larry, for example, right? I, in, yeah. In, I think, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And it's all about just playing the right thing at the right time. Some guys just have that gift. Um, yeah. Man, I'm, hey, I'm very – Before we move on, can I tell you my quick Steve Vai story? Cause yes, it's, please. Again, it's, I, I feel like, you know, I keep doing this, but again, right? That's, it's your – mate, it, it, it's, it's all – it's your show. No, the show's no, dedicated to you. It's, <laughs> my, it's my show, but the show is about you. So <laughs> yeah. wherever you want no, to take it. It's just, 
these magical moments in life, like, you know, about like the, the Musicians Institute and stuff. Um, the the um, Steve put on an event uh, called the, the Big Mama Jamathon. Some of it's on YouTube. And it was a three day event. And Nuno was there and Tom Morello and Vi and all these people. And a few of us select few because we were teachers at MI got to play with him. Right. And if you told the 15 year old me that was listening to Passion and Warfare and Flexible, when I was at my little seaside town, if you told me that, I would have told you you were out of your mind, right? And so the, the time comes and I, you know, how do you prepare for that? You don't, you know? So I walk out on the stage with him and, and by the way, his stage volume is possibly the loudest thing I've ever heard. And I've seen Deep Purple like four times. His really? stage volume is brutal i had plugs in and my ears were like now that was a day when my was i had i had a, a fender twin all the way up wow <laughs> yeah it was insane right but but anyway so i go out there and uh, and he goes he goes just play something right <laughs> and i went okay and i thought to myself the last the last five people that had played it was all full-on metal it was like it was pretty hard, right? You know, and Steve looked a bit exhausted, right? So I thought, all right. So I just start playing this funk thing, right? And I see him smile and I'm like, oh my God, this is really happening, you know? And we do, we go into a 20, 20 minute jam, just back and forth with his band, you know? And honestly, what an experience. I mean, and, and like, at the end, he gives me a big hug and everything. And I, you know, and now it's funny because I'm going to go and see him play next year and everything. And it's almost like, I'm not sure that really happened. There's a little bit of video of it and stuff, but again, these things are so surreal. And, and then of course, when he came to True Fire, you know, I, there was a little bit of, of interaction with that as well. So anyway, long story short, but just really, really like these magical things happen every once in a while. And it's just incredible. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. He's so, yeah. And I'll tell you something else as well. Like, you know, because, because he's kind of crazy on stage and everything, he couldn't be nicer. He's such a nice guy, you know, really nice. That's one thing I'm learning through talking through a lot of my guitar heroes doing this show yeah. is yeah. that a lot of the, the big guys are really, really nice. Um, I'm good friends with a, a, a chap here in Australia that's quite a well-known guitar player named Dave Leslie. He's from a group called The Baby Animals. And yeah, I remember The Baby Animals. Yeah, yeah. so they opened for Van Halen uh, on the yeah. uh, Carnal Knowledge Tour and, and all oh, that. Yeah. And, you know, they were doing some big things, opening for all the huge acts. And I can remember saying to Dave many years ago, um, like, you're hanging out with all these people, you know, that – do you encounter many assholes? And he said, no, no. Usually the big dudes are really nice. It's the guys that are almost famous that have got oh, the attitudes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, you know, I, must I think – I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I was, um, no, you go ahead because I, <laughs> I, just, I just lost my chain of thought. ADD. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, that's okay. Um, it's okay. No, I was, I was going to say because um, I, I met Larry Carlton, you know, yep. at, at the baked potato and um, – and he gave me some advice on the true fire shoot because he just that one you're talking about he just done when i was going i was going next you know yep. and and in my experience 99 out of 100 of these players and i don't just mean guitar players either i've met some incredible drummers and horn players and they're all really nice and you know what's great about that when you meet these people and they're very humble and you know like sometimes you know i have a very busy schedule and i'm a dad and all that sometimes it gets to the evening and i sort of think oh my goodness like shall i just put my feet up for an hour and i go you know what i'm going to play the guitar because these people i'm going to practice something for me you know at the end of the day because these people there's no ego and no attitude, you know, and it's like, it, it just reminds you to keep digging deeper and just like for the love of it, you know, because it's yeah. kind of that thing where even if you're tired, you put the time in and you get it back. I mean, I always feel that, don't you? It's like, you know, I mean, yeah. we all go through little, like, you know, there's plateaus and stuff like that. But, yeah. you know, I feel like if there's something about when you hear like a Lukather or, or, or a Vi or someone be, be self-depreciating, it, it, you know, and Scott Henderson's a great example. I mean, I'm sure you found in your interview, he's so hard on himself, like, you know, I mean, like almost to a ridiculous level, but the guy's incredible, you know, and yeah. it's like, there's something, something about that that's, that's uh, refreshing in a way, because like, I feel like maybe if you were in a different field, like maybe, I don't know, but like maybe if some, some sports people might not be quite like that, I don't know, but I'm just saying, you know, there's something like you say about your, your, your friend in the band, you know, it, it's, um, you know, it just, it just is a good reminder. Like we're all sort of in it together and it's all about the love of the music. You know? Yep. Yep. And the thing is, um, if you're not a nice guy, you're not going to get the work. It doesn't matter how good you are. Yeah. 
uh, people won't want to work with you. There are a couple of examples of people I've run into that are very well known that have not been very nice. I won't mention them, but but yeah, for the most part, it's actually it's it's shocking when that does happen because you're so used to people being cool, you know. <laughs> you know, there's two guys that spring to mind that everyone yeah. says, "Oh okay. man, that that those that guy is just so full of himself." And funnily yeah. enough, one of those guys is super influenced by the other. So I wonder if he tried to copy the attitude. Interesting. Oh, I think I, I think I know who you mean, but anyway, <laughs> I, think I, I think I spotted that one. But anyway, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, that's that's a big part of it. You know, when I had Pete Thorne on, um, we, it came up just about because uh, he gets a lot of cool gigs as a sideman. Oh, he's a great guy, Pete. I know, I know. And him. and that sort of came up that you need to be easy to get along with. Nobody's going to want to be hanging out with you at airports and squished mm -hmm. up on a plane next to you for hours if you're an arrogant asshole. But if Absolutely. you're – yeah, yeah, yeah. And having – and just in my experience, having run run quite a few bands over the years, you know, you got you got to spend a lot of time rehearsing together and, and being together. And, and yeah, if, if the person's – they could be the best player in the world, but if they're, if they're a really difficult person, it's just – it's no fun. It's really no fun, you know. Absolutely. Now, you said about Scott Henderson uh, and yeah. his self – depreciating kind of yeah. style there. Yeah. Um, and I think that's actually quite a healthy to recognize in your own self, you know, like, oh, man, I yeah. suck at blah, 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 or I suck at this. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anything about your own playing that you don't like? Oh, God, yeah, loads of things. Yeah, what, what, what does Rob Garland <laughs> yeah, want, need to work I'm, on? I'm, in, in your mind, I'm, what do you need to work on? I'll tell, you, I'll tell you one right off the bat, and that is I can't, I've, I've made peace with it because I've changed my style to adapt it. But because I was so, you know, 1978 back on these, I mean, I was, I wasn't listening to it then, but I, was, I discovered it in the early eighties, Gary Moore back on the streets, corridors of power, like Gary's picking technique, alternate picking technique was incredible and, and fast. And I know it's one of those things where it's not about having speed, but ever since I heard that as a kid, I've wanted to have that picking technique so that I can use it a bit, you know, not all the time, but just use it a bit. And I feel like I feel like it's just never quite been where I want it to be. And so I've developed a legato picking hybrid that works for me. And usually I can execute kind of what I'm going for. Yep. But there's a part of me that's like, damn it, I need to get on. Who's the guy with the cracking the code thing? You know, I need to get on. Yeah, Troy, yeah, yeah. Troy. Yep, Troy Grady. I need to sit there for six months and do that every day yep. and just finally do it because it, it's one of those things that it irritates me so much that some days it's there and some days it's just not, you know. So yeah. I must say that really pisses me off about my own playing is that I can't pick the way I want to, you know. Sure, uh, sure. And, 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 you know, but I'm more of a, even though I teach at, at these places and do this thing, I came from a very much a, I came much more from kind of like a feeling it's soul playing thing rather than a technique based approach. Like I grew up with those play like the Jeff Becks and everything. And it wasn't really like, I was never that guy that was going to sit there and do the metronome for, for 12 hours. I was going to write songs and I was going to work on stuff, but it was, it was always working on stuff I would use musically rather than exercises. You sure. know, and yeah. I, I feel like maybe I was too far the other way. I feel like, cause I, when I see these YouTube generations, you know, they've sat there and they've done all this, you know, oh, and yeah. it's, so I feel like I could, I should have done a bit more of that, and I'm, and I'm always trying to rebalance that. But I'm not sure you can when you get to a certain point. You know what I, I mean? I think you can. You know, you, 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 you mentioned, okay. you okay. mentioned uh, cracking the code with Troy Grady. Yeah. And yeah. um, did you see the episode I had with with Troy on? I saw a bit of it. Yeah, I watched the whole thing. Is yeah, yeah. That, that was that was yeah. a, another one of those three hour ones. Um, yeah, yeah. Because the time does fly. Um, oh sure. Yeah. Now I my picking sucked, and I didn't know why and then i watched his his animated series yeah. and it all made sense it's like oh that's what i'm doing wrong that's what these okay, guys so it does make sense to you because i get because you know I, the thing is with picking as well like there are some people that pick beautifully like george benson or marty freeman they look like they're arthritic right? yeah they're just yeah. like terrible right? and then i i get that you're trying to you're not trying to go completely across you're trying to you know arch either up or down but I just find it very difficult to keep that consistent for any length of time. You know, did you yeah. find what, what did you change about your picking that made that work for you? Okay. So for three note per string type playing, yeah. um, yeah. as you're going across the, the pick angle, like um, yeah. if I'm alternating 
probably, is it easiest for me to grab a guitar? No. Sure. Yeah. So to, to jump strings down, up, down, and I'm going to yeah. go jump. So my pick is angled out so that it clears the next yeah. string and, and catches it back right. on the up. Then the next three, right. it's going to be the opposite. So as I'm going across the string, my hand changes angle. Uh, there's that. I used yeah. to be down that. Um, I thought that alternate picking that guys were picking every freaking note, but then to right. find out that someone like Ingve, when he descends yep. on a three note, yep. the last note is a pull off so that he's right. ready to, yep. Right. All these little things. There's yep. a few little things that, um, Troy brought up that I'm just like, oh, um, the Van Halen thing where he hammers, like if he does three note per string run, he'll hammer the first string and then alternate pick the second. Yeah, I transcribed transcribe some stuff from 1984 and that's exactly what I discovered. Yeah. You know, it's like, yeah, it's he does a lot pick, of that. You know? Yeah. And that's a very strange sequence if you're not used to it though, isn't it? It's a very, it takes It is, but once you get used to it, uh, I remember yeah. pulling that out in front of a, a friend on the coast who's quite a, a flashy guitar player. Um, mm -hmm. I was trying a piece of gear at his place and I did that and he just looked at me and went, what the hell was that, yeah. man? Did right, you just right, pick right, all yeah. that? And we're like, Nah, that first half was hammered, but it sounds it because your ear yeah. catches that second half. Yeah, right. Yeah, and, this, and and I think you know, going back to what we were talking about about those guitar moments that that affected you. You know, like I could hear Richie Blackmore's pick digging into string. I could hear Ingve's pick squeaking on the string, and I love that. You know, and 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 the, like when Gary Moore was doing that, I could I could hear it. And if I was going to legato that, it's it's not you know it's not. This, it doesn't have it's very subtle but i want to hear it and i want to feel that what i'm going for you know what i mean like yeah like, there's a difference when you hear that pick strike i love that sound as well you know so yeah it's so i'm not really i'm not really a fast player i'm really not i come much more from that larry carlton school of playing but i, I have moments where i really need to express that you know yeah, so it's yeah. like, I, I, I must say i found my own way of doing it which probably isn't a bad thing you know, because you sort of divine your own style based on limitations as well as strength, don't you? You know, absolutely. So I found a way to do it now, and it works fine. But I, I, it's still something that I would like to clean up a bit. Put it that way. So one thing I struggle with with picking, um, and Gary Moore is a master of this, and yeah. so is Joe Bonamassa. Um, yeah. Is alternate picking two note per string patterns? So your typical right. pentatonic shape. Yeah, I can pick the first one, pull off or hammer on, depending which direction yeah. I'm going, pretty damn quick. Uh, but to alternate pick the whole run, either ascending or descending two note per string, yeah. I find that very hard. And um, yeah, it's one thing I hear in Gary Moore and Joe Bonamassa that I just go. See, that, oh, that, I don't, oh. that I don't have a problem with. That makes sense to me. I, I can pretty much get that fairly yeah. smooth. It's when I'm adding another note in that it's, you know. That it's, yeah, that's, right. That's, yeah. Yeah, right, the yeah. whole three note per string thing was a real yeah. revelation. As I said, trying to learn different ways of navigating the fretboard. Well, um, I must say, just because what we're going, we mentioned earlier, and that thing I mentioned about how I was, I was this new idea I've had about breaking shapes from five down to two. I call it the three string concept. And essentially, if you were going to play a major scale, starting on your little finger, right, on on the low E string. And or a mixolydian, let's say, right? And you play up that shape. What the way the guitar is laid out is if you play up three strings and you slide up two frets, it's going to repeat. Whatever sh any shape you play is going to repeat like that. And so I found by using intervals like thirds or, or, or sequencing, you can get some of those long because it was always a mystery to me. I would hear those super long, cool rock runs, right? That, that seemed like has gone on so long. How is that, you know, like from back in the day, the Jakey Lees and all this kind of thing, right? And 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 I figured out that I could use that sequencing idea and it really works. You know, it's like, so those three, the same scale pattern across three strings, you end on the seven, you slide up two frets and you're back at the root and then that fingering will repeat anywhere on the guitar. Yeah, and It's really quite, uh, it really yep. makes, it simplifies the neck and it's yep. good for those three note per string things, you know. I'll, I'll do something similar to that. Uh, yeah. Well, I'll do a three note per string pattern. Yeah. Yeah. And then slide up two frets, go into the next right, one. Right. Yeah. 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 Now, now this goes against everything that I would have thought, but if I start that by mm. doing up strokes, so yeah. I go up, down, up, chain string, down, up, down, that it all keeps it. Um, yeah. 
Well, funnily enough, on those super fast Gary Moore runs, he would put almost like a ghost note in first as a downstroke, and he would emphasize the first up, which is exactly that. There you go. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Go. That was something also, that that yeah. I stumbled on. Um, I was doing something. I was filming myself maybe for just a quick YouTube post or something. I was like, what did I just do then? That felt right, like right. I picked everything, but I did it half speed, but it sounded like everything came out like I was picking it, and I had to slow it down and watch. I was like, I started on an up, and it just strategically right, placed right. – uh, the right my, my fingers to be in the right position basically to, to pull that off so yeah it, it's amazing these little things and, and something else that 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 three string idea lends itself to goes back to your comment about larry carlton and blues phrasing on the idea of question and response motifs what i've noticed when i introduce this idea to students is because they see the way their fingers uh, are on the fretboard it's very easy for them to then see intervals like the third finger to the little finger is a third to a fourth and the third finger to the little finger on the next string is a sixth to a flat seven and so or major seven if you want to do major and so what it leads is lends itself to is if you come up with a musical motif like that let's say you bend your third finger and then go to the little finger when you shift up two frets even if you're not aware of what the notes are you can repeat that exact phrase or at least hint at it in the next position and part of great blues phrasing or, or any phrasing is question and answer motif space but that gives you an immediate visual uh you know reference point to be able to do that which was a lot i'm, I'm introducing this idea to people and they're really seeing something like that because what they would do is they would start off with an idea but then they go to the next position and the fingering wouldn't be the same and they find it very difficult to then continue that idea yeah you know? yeah yeah you know i mean one thing that um I was very open about the fact when when I said I started seeing myself eating shit, improvising live, and I yeah. put the call out on Facebook. I was just like, "Hey, I'm just interested, you know, guitar players. How do you how do you view the fretboard and blah blah blah?" Uh, yeah. I had a, a fairly well known guitar player here in Australia um, send me a, a PDF of a, a booklet that he was working on called his guitar manual or something like that, yeah. and it took you just through some basics that you should know. You know, this is a pentatonic scale. This is a minor pentatonic scale. Then the next thing he had in there was, this is the major minor pentatonic scale. And mm -hmm. I was like, hello, what's this? And he had just essentially um, combined the major and minor pentatonic scales. Yeah. So that what you referred to as position one, you're in A, a minor playing at the fifth fret, right, and then you've right. got the next one up where you go up into yeah. – yeah. um, he overlaid the two of those. And right. I played through that, played over some some music and went – that's that thing. That's that thing. Right. You know, I hear guys like Stevie Ray Vaughan, Eric Clapton, Angus Young do this yeah. all the time. Yeah. And I had no idea what they were doing. It's like, is that major? Is that minor? Because the progression right. kind of isn't either. Right. And that was a revelation. I, and I use that a lot now. And is that – and and so if, if you were in like a – like a dominant situation, like a blues or something, you probably put more emphasis on the major third than the minor, but you'd still use it as well. So you hear that chromatic passing sound. Yeah, right? yeah. One, one thing, when I start, I started transcribing um, Larry Carlton and um, uh, some Luke Arthur and, and all those guys, and and then went into kind of the jazz world a little bit with Wes Montgomery and some of those people. And what I what I noticed they would do is when they would play a pentatonic, if they were using the minor pentatonic. They would put the six in or if they were using the major pentatonic they would put the flat seven in it's kind of the same idea and but but i noticed they would use kind of a hybrid run so it, it, your ear gets so used to hearing what a pentatonic sounds like when you ascend or descend but if you just change one note like the sixth for example you know it makes a huge difference you know yeah. and, and it's suddenly it's warmer and it's not quite so traditional blues you know it's a little bit jazzier and so that's how i started customizing those pentatonics back then you know and that led to that and then that led me to that approach i was saying about earlier where i'll take one tone and really isolate it against the different chords and a different chord progression and just hear what it what it does but by taking a pentatonic and customizing actually the first true fire course i ever did was about that yeah. uh you know it's, it's a good way to do it and that like you say that major and minor uh because that's that's something that everybody uses but and then the guys the next step after that would be to take the arpeggio of whatever chord you're playing over and really see what what you're emphasizing as well. Yeah, right. Yep. Awesome. Hey, Rob, have, have you, you got some original music of yours um, out there? Yep. I do. I do. I have a lot, actually. I um, 
so my my uh, band I had for a number of years, Rob Garland, the Blue Monks did a few albums. But in in recent years, I used to put CDs out, and in recent years, I kind of I went to and I was at Nam one year. And now, you know, how at NAM you get talking to people in the in the lunch line and that's where you meet all your contacts, you know. Yeah. And somebody said to me, how can I hear your music? And I said, well, here's a CD. And the guy goes, I've got nothing to play that on. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. Know? So, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm old school. I still buy CDs. I got a system, you know. But so anyway, uh, for the last few years, I've just been putting stuff out digitally. So I'm on Spotify, Apple Music, Bandcamp. You know, I, I just released a new single a uh, couple of months ago, and it has Marco Miniman on drums, who's a phenomenal drummer, uh, you know, who plays with Joe Satriani and the, the Aristocrats and Stephen Wilson. Um, so that's the latest one. But but yeah, if anybody wants to, if anybody wants to check it out, just go on Spotify or, or Apple Music or Bandcamp or iTunes, you know, um, and just type in Rob Garland or go to robgarland.net my website and there's links to all that stuff on there so, nice yeah. well i was going to ask if you have a, a a website is there yeah is there links to um so teaching material online is it all exclusively yeah. through uh true fire and jam play or do you no, have so additional content I, have, I do have additional content i have if again if you go to the robgarland.net it's all kind of the hub is there um, so I have, there's, a, there's some videos on YouTube and stuff. One thing I would like to mention is for the last year, I started a Patreon site and it's actually, look at this product placement here, the British invasion. Oh, right? nice. <laughs> so, so, uh, so and, and what I do with that is, um, I, I started it pretty cheaply, like five, five bucks a month. And what I do is all the members get two exclusive new guitar lessons or they or they get one every two weeks that aren't available anywhere else. I write these lessons up, do the charts, do some video and stuff, and they get two of those a month. And then we do a monthly live chat where we all get on Zoom and have a laugh. Uh, you know, and I'm really trying to build a community. I, I do music downloads on there, and there's a forum and stuff like that. So that's kind of something I've been putting a lot of energy into. Um, there's also another tier where, where which is more expensive, where I do a masterclass, um, a 75 minute one topic masterclass once a month as well. But you know, I encourage people to have a look at the 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 basic one because it's it's you know it's I'm really trying to build it up and it's been a lot of fun so far. We've had some good some good chats on it and stuff. But uh, yeah, so I put a lot of time and effort into those lessons because you know I want them to be something you can't get anywhere else, basically. Yeah. You know? So yep. I do those, uh, and then you know, yeah, and I've got some I've got a bunch of free lessons on on YouTube and stuff as well. If you go to my, again, if you go to the website, there's links to all of that. Um, I wrote a I wrote a book during the pandemic as well a new a new book but instead of doing another instructional book I, I did one on motivation and practice concepts so what I thought I'd do and it's it's a four dollar book on Amazon you know it's an ebook it's yeah. called Guitar Play um, and, and what what I what I focused on with that was that um, you know I said when we're young we play the guitar as we get older we practice and it becomes, you know, that has a negative connotation to it. Sure. Right? Yep. So let's get back to play with the guitar. That's kind of the concept for the book. And I go yep. through like, you know, um, how do you stay motivated? You know, um, not getting hung up on things like this guy's a better player than I am, not getting too hung up on gas, you know, <laughs> gear yeah. acquisition syndrome. So yep. that was kind of another thing I did, you know, because I think, I think, as you know, if you've if you've looked at True Fire and you've looked and obviously, you know, YouTube and everything, I think there's in some ways there's a lot more information available, obviously, than than like when you or I were, were teenagers learning the guitar. But I think that provides another challenge. You know, I think I see people having like ADD with the amount of musical lessons coming at them you know and gear sites and everything like that i think i think it becomes very challenging for people like your your example of the larry carton thing is is a really good one because you took one idea that motif idea and you applied it to real life gig you got positive feedback from someone on the gig and then i bet that stayed with you right absolutely you know? and every time you know? i use that technique now i consciously do it the reaction i get from people is like Ah, it's not about. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> no, um, and what I what I see with students is, yeah, you know, I'll say to them, you know, like like uh, this cage thing is so important. You know, if you want to play like you were talking about earlier, that that playing those great rhythm parts, right? But you can't you can't just learn it this week and then next week be on to something else. You've mm. got to, you know, it's like I don't know where people think this idea came from that you just hear it and you know it, 
you know it's like yeah. it certainly doesn't work like that for me you know so it's it's you really got to apply yourself and and so that's a big issue i see even though it's wonderful that we have all these this great tuition material and obviously i'm actually making some of it but uh you know it, it's that um it's it's taking on an idea and living with it long enough so you can really see it come to fruition in your playing you know yep. alan holdsworth right you know arguably genius on the guitar used to say he would work on something and it wouldn't come out in his playing for 18 months wow you know so <laughs> and that's yeah, alan holdsworth yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. You know. so so speaking about having so much stuff out there and not knowing where to start yeah. um yeah. bernie in the chat room has asked a very good question yeah. um he says i cannot play solos third note is a bum note what do i learn first that's a hard question where, where does somebody start so i what well i need to i need to know is he comfortable with say pentatonic for example if he's comfortable with the minor pentatonic um, here's what I would, here's what I would say. I would say that's five notes, right? So you take a song, we'll use our key. We've been talking about today. Take a song in a minor, go up to, go up to the, um, I mean, I would call it the D minor cage shape, but you might call it the second a minor pentatonic position, right? And just give, give yourself a limitation. Say, I'm only going to play on the G, B and E strings up there. And, and that, that looks like a D minor chord. And that's the five notes that are in an a minor pentatonic. Put a song on, a jam track, A minor blues, and just sit there in that one position. And what you got to do is you got to make a musical statement in that box using only those notes. You could use two of them or three of them, right? And and if the third note sounds like a bad note, then play a different third note, you know? So, so and do this, play a simple phrase, right? Maybe you go, bad, da, da, right? And then just leave some space and think, what should I answer that with? Because I see people getting overwhelmed because we have this big fretboard with all these notes, right? So what you want to do is bring it in like this and say, I'm going to put a limitation on my practice and I'm going to make music in that one spot on the neck. And then you want to record yourself doing it. I guarantee you'll hear something in there you like. Go back, learn what it is you like, you know, and that becomes part of your vocabulary then and just build it up like that. That's where I would start anyway. Yeah. yeah. Nice. It, it's funny just the different approaches people have to, to practicing. Uh, I had Carl Verhayen on here um, yeah. a couple of months ago, and he had a, a, a notebook, and he said when he practices, he actually writes down ideas. He stumbles on something. He writes it all down. And He's got a huge – he's got this lick book that he's been carrying around with him. Same thing with Mike Stern. Both those guys have been carrying around this book for like 50 years <laughs> and writing down every little thing in it. Yeah, it, it, yeah absolutely. You know, it, it, it's different for – for different people but but it just and that's a good approach too to write everything down like that but but in my experience you know it's very easy to fill a book and then not him because he's obviously you know he's very focused on what he's doing but but for the rest of us it's easy to fill a book with ideas but do you really have you really spent enough time on page two you know that would be my question, exactly you know, for exactly the rest of us, you know? yeah it's yeah. like oh, you could take that one little blues box that i just mentioned you could transcribe some Albert King licks because he's using that exact box, you know, or some parts of Stevie Ray Vaughan, you know, and, and it's important to make music right away with it because if, as soon as you start making music with it and you're going to feel inspired to continue, you know. Yep, yep. Uh, Rob, we've been talking for two and a half hours now, mate. The time goes, I mean, goes quick, crazy. doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. So I might round things up. Mate, thank you yeah, so much for your time. It's been yeah. great talking to you. Yeah, uh, really it's funny it. because uh, one of the comments here is uh, you guys are on the same level. That This show will go on for a day and I still enjoy every minute. <laughs> Brilliant. So, Brilliant. yeah, mate, I'd love to have you on again sometime. If you're up oh, for I it, I really yeah. enjoyed it. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, as as, so as you saw, it's nice and easy. I just send you a, the, that link. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, I, I'll just I'll just tell the people watching real quick. It's kind of funny because uh, I have my my family visiting here at Christmas in LA, and my daughter's off school, and I've been building IKEA furniture for two days straight. So this has been a very welcome break from building furniture. Oh, I'm nice, nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, no, Rob, thank I, I thank I, you yeah, again. I really enjoyed it. And um, I hope you had a good time. Uh, everybody give him a nice round of applause. <laughs> and thanks, everyone. Like, subscribe, all that kind of stuff. Spread the word. I've, I've had a couple of, a few weeks break from this, but I've got some great guests coming up and um, people just don't know about me. So 
share and all that kind of stuff to help, help get the word out there, folks. And um, yeah, that, hopefully I'll get some, some more great guests. Rob, thank you so much. See you guys.